This is three hours of the very best r slash entitled people stories of this year. Take off your mask. I was just out mowing my lawn. A neighbor came by walking her dog. She stopped and started saying something. I shut off the mower, removed my ear protection and walked over to her. The first words that I could understand were, you really don't have to wear a mask. Before I could reply, she went into a rant about how COVID is a hoax and wearing a mask doesn't really protect you. And it's just a government plot to control us and China is making millions selling us masks we don't even need. And even Biden now says the pandemic is over and I don't need a mask when I'm all alone in my front yard. When she finally stopped to take a breath, I removed my mask and told her that I always wear it when mowing my lawn because the pollen and grass clippings make me cough and sneeze. She pondered that for a moment, then said, oh, well, I guess that's okay. And went on her way and there it is officially my favorite entitled people post i've ever read in my life fantastic happy 4th of july to you too you selfish female dog my husband's entitled mum is absolutely notorious for doing these things in this order one constantly criticize and guilt trip us about not visiting enough two ask her to appear at her house on a certain day three we call and text that day before leaving our house to confirm arrangements she says yes four we drive the hour to her house five we arrive and she is not there yes at the appointed time six we are expected to wait for her to get home sometimes it's four or five hours sometimes she never comes back at all seven During this interlude in passive aggressive hell, sometimes she responds to us on her cell phone. Often though, she doesn't. And my husband wastes half his day waiting in her empty house. Eight, sometimes she eventually comes back. Sometimes she does not. After experiencing this a few times with my husband, I now give her 20 minutes, then we leave. Nine, several hours later, when she finally arrives home and doesn't see us patiently waiting, she starts texting angrily about, why weren't you there? And why didn't you call me? We were there, we did call her. And then finally, number 10, she sends passive aggressive texts for the next four to 10 days, absolutely infuriated that we didn't spend all day waiting for her. There is a variation of this where she says she's coming to my house. It's usually her idea because, duh, I know she's about as reliable as a dead cat. In that version, we clear one of my husband's days off for her. We miss out on other things we'd rather do. We cook food to feed her dinner. We clean the house and stress all day instead of relaxing. And then she either doesn't show up at all, cancels just before she was supposed to arrive, or sends a string of texts and calls, lots of texts and calls about how her life is hard and she's busy doing things and okay she guesses she's not coming she does this on my son's and husband's birthdays she does it at the holidays she does it on summer weekends where we all could have been doing something else so okay i guess i'm partly to blame for what happened yesterday july 4th because i know what she's like and in all the busy of the weekend of the 4th we made it to fireworks a barbecue and two different birthday parties in two days I forgot to have a backup plan in case grandma bailed on our plans more fool me to fit her into our crammed weekend we cut out some much needed quiet family time and naps at our house before we went to the fireworks at 10. we've been planning this with her all week my husband had texted to confirm before leaving our house which again is an hour away and she had said yes we arrive and guess what the dog isn't there she decided to go out on her boat instead It was 90 plus degrees, 6 p.m., and we've got four hours to kill before fireworks. We can't wait in the heat, and I'm not going to wait all day in her house with my son, who is being blown off by grandma yet again, and who didn't get a fourth at all last year because COVID. We don't have enough gas or gas money to drive home, sleep till fireworks time, and drive back. So I took him swimming. I had to buy shorts for both of us to swim in because we had on nice new clothes for grandma's dinner she was supposedly having us over for. Thank God Walmart is cheap. It was too hot not to swim. So we're splashing around and actually having a great time. And about three hours later, the frantic texts and calls began. She is furious because why didn't you call me? And why didn't you answer my texts? And are you coming over to eat or not? I made my husband turn his phone off 
and we ate McDonald's for dinner and went to a completely different spot to watch fireworks than we usually do. It was on the river and the sunset over the water was absolutely beautiful and we had tons of fun giving each other silly internet quizzes. Great memories for my son and that's what really matters, not his super selfish grandma. Look guys, I'll be honest, I'm not the most organized person ever. Uh, I'm often quite late for things that I need to be on time for or that I said I'd be at at a certain time. But um, even me, even me in my unorganized state, I'm not as bad as this grandma. I mean, one thing I would never do is invite people over to my house and then not be there where at the time that I've said for them to come over and then be hours and hours late to your own house. How is that even possible? If you're inviting people over to your own gaff and you're not there, how is that possible? I don't get that. I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. Now moving on to our second story. Now this title guys might be one of the most shocking I've ever seen. Entitled mother thinks she can cure stuttering by hitting a baby in the mouth. Now just quick heads up. No baby gets harmed in this story. It's just an entitled mum suggesting a tactic. But still, what sort of title is that? This did not directly happen to me. It was my mother talking to my sister. Then my sister told me about it afterwards. Little backstory. When I was a kid, I had a pretty bad stutter. Even nowadays, some big words can trip me up if I'm very excited or anxious. But my speech is pretty good now. Good enough to earn a bachelor's in communications, I suppose. Anyways, I also have a wonderful stepmother whom I love. And she always goes out of her way to help me with everything. When I entered sixth grade, stepmom and dad organized to enroll me in a speech class in my school that would really help me to be rid of my stutter. And after about a year, my speech was much improved. My own mother, however, is definitely the jealous type. And to say the least, didn't take kindly to my stepmom helping me where she couldn't or wouldn't. Recently, my niece has been developing a stutter at a young age. And my sister decided to talk to our mum about it. Here is that convo. Hey mum, my daughter's developed a bad stutter. It's getting a little worse actually over the past few weeks. Well, take a clean dish rag, wet it and pop it across her mouth like a slingshot. That's what your grandma did to OP and your great grandma did to her. I noticed the stutter on Sunday. Um, no, my brother had a speech therapist at his elementary school. No, your grandma popped him in the mouth with a wet towel. What? I'm not popping her. No, my brother had a speech therapist in school to work with him weekly. Then it went away. No, I'm the mother. I'm telling you what my mother did. She caught OP and your uncle off guard and popped them in the mouth. Oh, well, never mind, mum. I'm a mother too. I was just saying that I am your brother's mum, and I know what my mum did. His school did not cure him. My mum did. Try it. Uh, okay, mum. Obviously, my sister did not try that. And obviously, our mum is lying about our grandma hitting me. Our grandma was the most loving and kind individual to all her grandkids. Obviously, I can't speak for her tactics in raising my mum and aunts and uncles on the account of not being alive yet, but I can assure you that she never punched me in the mouth. It's actually impossible for my grandma to have attempted that when I was so young because she passed away when I was 10 years old and my stutter wasn't addressed until sixth grade when I would have been around 11 or 12. My sister also texted our stepmom after that too. And immediately, our stepmom reached out to an actual speech therapist who then contacted my sister with advice and to set up an appointment. I think it's obvious who we turn to whenever we need any help or advice in future. Yeah, I wonder who you're going to go with. Y your weird mum who's telling you to literally hit your kid or an actual speech therapist whose job it is to, you know, do speech therapy. Tough decision. <laughs> Seriously, popping someone in the mouth. Like what? As in like getting a towel or something and then flicking it at them. What is that going to do apart from just, you know, cut their lip? So weird. Again, I can actually relate to the story a little bit. I had a lisp when I was younger and I went through speech therapy and now I speak unbelievably well. I think you'd agree. I, I, I speak decently. Um, but still, I can tell you that speech therapy legit works. Um, I can't tell you, to be fair, if getting hit in the mouth works or not. Never tried it myself. Fortunately, it was never tried on me by my mum or grandma. But hey... Give it a go. Come back to me. Maybe it's a cheap way of fixing a crazy problem. I really doubt it though. And now moving on to our final story of today's episode. I'm too old to have plushies. Right then, let me explain what happened. So I was currently out at a friend's house and my mum was hanging out with some of her friends at home. One of them needed to use the bathroom. 
and since the one on their floor was in use my mum said she could use the one upstairs which would have been fine if she hadn't then decided to start checking people's rooms out on the way the rooms upstairs are my parents room my bathroom my dad's gaming room my study room i mostly just use it for online school and my bedroom she went into my room and i assume the first thing she saw was my monokuma plush on my bed he's my favorite plushie by the way she then finally comes back downstairs with monokuma in hand asking why her son owns this my mum tells her that it's actually mine her friend gets upset thinking because i'm 16 that i don't need a teddy bear anymore uh yeah that's funny considering i got monokuma for my 16th birthday anyways so my mum tried to take monokuma back from her friend and the other friends told her that it's not her kid and she should just leave it be but this dog had the audacity to make my mum watch as she tried to throw monokuma away luckily my mum got it back before she could and then forced her to leave the house more of the story don't try to raise other people's kids you know what i don't actually own any plushies of my own but i definitely should they're cool and they're not like little teddy bears they're just like nice decorations and, and things to have on your wall or whatever you know on your shelves they look cool let me know by the way if i should get a plushie which one should i get and also would you ever like to see a redditor plushie i know other youtubers have released plushies and stuff and they're very sick and there are some cool companies that i could work with to make this happen um you know what comment down below like the video do you want to see that happen i can definitely make it happen but only if you guys care enough let me know i'd want to see it happen though i mean to be fair it doesn't even have to be me it could just be like a karen or something i could definitely make that happen let me know down below entitled mother thinks i should give my diabetes snacks to her daughter so i'm a type 1 diabetic and in the morning i went out for a bike ride as i'm a diabetic i always bring snacks with me in case i go low or get hungry I bring a juice box, a few glucose tablets, two fruit chew bars, and two granola bars. Just enough for me to be able to correct my blood sugar twice and have a small snack. As I was biking home, I passed someone sitting on the ground who looked like they were kind of distressed. So I pulled over to ask if they were okay. The guy was a little younger than me and told me he was a diabetic and showed me his medic alert necklace. He explained that he'd gone low while biking but forgot to refill the snacks in his bag when he left so he was trying to figure out what to do. He didn't have anyone to bring him anything, but he also didn't want to call an ambulance over this. So I offered him my snacks and to sit with him while we waited for it to go back up, explaining that I was also a diabetic. After I'd sat down with him and given him the tablets, a woman came over and asked me for my juice box for her daughter. I explained that I was giving him what I had because he was a diabetic and had low blood sugar and I needed the rest to ensure I could get home safe. She started to tell me that she and her daughter had been biking for a few hours and she was hungry and just wanted my juice box and a granola bar. I asked her if her daughter was diabetic and she said no. So I apologized and again explained nicely that I need those for myself. The conversation that followed is as such. So why did you give him some? Because he is a diabetic and his blood sugar is very low. For reference, our blood sugar is supposed to be between 4 and 8 and his was 2.3. Do you know him? No, but as a diabetic, I know how dangerous lows can be. And if I was in his position, I'd hope a fellow diabetic would try and help me. So you don't know him? The conversation continued like that. Her asking why I cared if I didn't know him and me giving the same explanation until the guy rechecked his blood sugar and it was back up to 3.5. As this was still a little too low for both of us to feel comfortable, I grabbed my juice to give to him. And this is when the entitled mum tried to grab it out of my hand, saying that if his blood sugar was still low, I should just call him an ambulance and then I could give my snacks to her daughter. At this point, I was honestly kind of fuming and I just told her to F off and that as a mum, she should have thought to bring snacks for her daughter. And if I hadn't gone by, what would she have done? She went red in the face, called me a female dog and stormed back to her daughter. The dude's levels went up and we parted ways. And as I started to bike away, I heard the mum shout after me, calling me a female dog yet again. I mean, seriously, guys, what am I even supposed to say to this? It's just, uh, I don't understand sometimes. 
first of all, asking a random stranger for food is a bit weird, isn't it? Because you've forgotten to bring your own food for your own daughter. Just going up to a random stranger and asking them for their food in the first place. I think that's a little bit dodgy. Second of all, when they say that it's specifically for people with diabetes, either themselves or people they happen to help, just, you know, who are suffering from a blood sugar low. And then you go again. You go for the second time and you say, no, I don't care about that. My daughter, who doesn't have diabetes, is starving. And I need your food now. I don't care about the person sitting next to you whose blood sugar level is seriously low, by the way. Ah, oh, it's unbelievable. Both the editor of these videos, Steve-O, some of you will know him, and also my granddad are people that I know pretty well, um, and they both have diabetes. I've experienced it with my granddad in particular. When his blood sugar level gets super low, his whole body starts to shut down because obviously it can't act in the way it's meant to do. It really can't function, and it's scary stuff. So I don't know how this woman has never met someone with diabetes before, ever seen someone go through a blood sugar level drop. Have any of you seen it? I presume it's quite common that people, I mean, a lot of people do have diabetes. I just don't know how this woman has lived such a sheltered life to not really understand it. That or she does understand it and it's just being super selfish. Which one do you think it is? I'm not too sure. Now moving on to our second story of today's episode. Lady claims I stole her car and the police were called. I've seen posts about this kind of thing and thought, no way this is real. What kind of idiot would call the police for that? Well, yesterday it happened and I'm still confused as to what this lady was thinking. We have been looking for a car for our youngest. Looking through online ads, we came across an ad for a luxury car that only wanted about a third of what this car blue books for. It says the car just suddenly stopped starting. My husband is a mechanic, so we decided to look at it just to see. Immediately, he sees a couple potential problems as to why it doesn't start. The car has new tires, the body is nearly perfect, the interior needs a few easy fixes. It's still worth way more than the owner is asking for, even with paying for the repairs to get it running. Of course, we bought it. Our youngest was ecstatic about getting a luxury car for graduation. My husband gets the car running. It was actually even easier than he originally thought. And now it's time for Crazy Lady. So, for plates and registration, off to the DMV we go. We come out with the temporary tags, and as my husband is putting them on the car, this crazy lady walks up. Excuse me? I was distracted by my phone. Hmm? Excuse me? I'm sorry, do you need something? Yes, that car. My car? What about it? Where did you get it? We bought it a few weeks ago. That's my car. My husband then intervened. No, it isn't. Now get away from us. Yes, that is the car I was going to buy from the previous owner and you stole it from me. No, lady, I paid the previous owner what they were asking for and nothing was said about you. Leave us alone. The previous owner and I had an agreement about the car and you came in and made her sell it to you. I want it back and I want it now. I had to buy that POS over there instead. Now, you take the POS and give me my car. What the F, you idiot? Get the heck out of my way before I run your stupid butt over. I'm not going anywhere. I've already reported to the police that I found my stolen car and they are on the way. Are you freaking nuts, lady? You can't just report a car stolen because you missed the chance to buy it. What this insane lady didn't know is we are actually waiting on the previous owner to show up to get her plate in registration because there was a mix up with the title, the DMV's fault, and we had to wait to get that fixed before we could title, register and plate it. So we were still using the correct plates. The previous owner can then turn in her plate and get a refund for the months not used. Two police cruisers pulled up about five minutes later. The previous owner pulled in right behind them. As the two officers are getting out and asking who called, the previous owner walked up to me and my husband asking what was going on. She hadn't noticed the crazy lady yet. The crazy lady immediately started yelling about how she paid for this car and we forced the previous owner to give us the title instead. She wanted us arrested and her given the title and possession of the car right now. One of the officers walked over to us. I grinned because it was actually one of my friend's sons. I grew up with and was friends with his oldest son. 
The officer said to me, Hey, Brandy, wanna tell me what's going on? Oh, I don't really know. We bought this car a few weeks ago from her, I point to the previous owner, and while we were waiting for her to show up to get her plate, this woman started screaming at us about stealing the car. Something about the previous owner and this lady had an agreement about the car, but the previous owner sold it to us instead. And now this crazy woman is demanding we take whatever car she ended up buying and we give her this one. Then the previous owner got involved. Oh my God. This is exactly why I didn't sell her the car in the first place. She's my neighbor and she is insane. She asked me about it when I decided to sell it and I told her she could buy it, but she wanted me to get it running again, but still sell it to her for the low price. I told her I didn't want to deal with it and that's why it was so low. If I got it running again, I might just keep it, but I definitely raised the selling price to at least double. She's actually called me a few times asking if I had it running yet and I've told her no But she kept telling me to call her when I did the officer then went with all the procedures Checked all of our ids checked the bill of the sale previous registration and ran the vin everything checked out I think we're done here. Then he addressed the crazy lady Mom, it's actually a crime that you've attempted here. You made a false report, which is illegal, and I could arrest you, but I'm not going to. I'm sure you're just upset and you made a bad judgment call, so we'll let it slide. No, it wasn't a false report. That is my car. Mom, stop. Just stop. I could also charge you with attempted car theft, but we're all just going to walk away now. No, I'm not just walking away. This is BS. She pointed at the previous owner. You owe me, insert amount that is double what we paid for the car. And you, I will get my car back. The second officer then said, Mom, step over by the cruiser. We need to have a talk. I gave the plate to the previous owner and the first officer told us to have a nice day. My husband and I went ahead and left while the previous owner went into the DMV. The crazy lady was still ranting at the second officer about allowing us to steal the car. The previous owner actually texted me later that the crazy lady was in the back of the police car when she left, still yelling. I'm not worried about any future contact with this mental woman. We don't live in the town where the DMV is or where they live. In a couple of months, the car will be two hours away with my youngest at college. The crazy lady doesn't even know our names and the previous owner has no idea where we live. All right, OP, I know you've just said that you're not worried about the crazy lady getting involved in the future, but I'm not going to lie. Reading that last sentence and saying you don't mind because the car is going to be two hours away with your son at college. I wouldn't put it past this mental woman to do some, you know, background research, a little bit of tracking and ultimately go and try and find the car and take it back at your son's college. I genuinely think that's something this crazy woman actually could do. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I don't really think she stands much chance trying to steal a car back off of your son. But I think it's the sort of thing that someone like that would do. Just be warned is all I'm going to say. I've seen entitled women and entitled people in the past, I must say, do crazier things than that. So, um, yeah, just be careful. You're not completely safe yet. I'm not going to lie. I mean, guys, imagine the follow up to this story. Like part two, the crazy lady actually tried to come and steal the car. That'd be amazing. I don't know how she'd get up to the college two hours away, how she'd find out. But wow, that would be an immense... That would be um, a pretty insane story. I kind of want it to happen in a way, just being selfish, because what a story that would be. Obviously, um, it would be quite funny, but also a bit of a pain in the butt for uh, your son and you as a family. But um, yeah, I kind of want her to try. It'd be funny, wouldn't it? Anti-masker needs to look in the mirror. This one's short and sweet. I'm at the Mart of Walls and in line to pay, minding my own business. A senior girl starts going off on the cashier about masks. I couldn't keep my chuckle in because it's just so stupid by this point with these people. Am I right? Cue the old bat whirling on me. The usual, I'm a sheep, I'm stupid, everything's fake, her rights are being infringed upon, etc. I just looked at her and waited. When she paused, I said, that's fine. Your shirt is inside out. I've never seen an anti-masker grab their things so fast and flee in embarrassment. Oh, wow. What a line. Perfectly delivered. Just, you know, telling her to shut up pretty much, but in a more polite way. How are anti-maskers still a thing in 2021? I don't really know, but well done. Well done, OP. Now moving on to our second story of the episode. I let a restaurant go to hell on a busy Saturday night 
and it kickstarted my career. This was when I was 18. I'm 34 now, so around 2004, 2005. Think pre-iPhone, but cell phones like the Nokia 3310 exist, which I had because my parents wanted to make sure I could always be contacted. I worked at a bar chain restaurant for six months. Let's call it C. It was a completely new store. When we opened, we were the only building for eight blocks, except for the sister restaurant next door that was part of the same investment group as C. It was a decent upper middle class white neighborhood, so we get lots of people in the door. I was originally hired as to go, but I was trained up in almost everything in the restaurant and I frequently filled in shifts and I got the most hours for it. It was the worst job I ever had and it still is. After getting shifted around to different homes, to go, QA, host, sometimes server, I eventually ended up in bus, which is cleaning tables. They promised they would move me off of bus once we had buses, but as we'll find out later, that day never came. The main reason this happened is that we ran out of buses. They tried hiring buses at a rapid rate, but it didn't work. The average survival rate for a busser was two weeks, including training time. Eventually, our reputation of chewing out buses made its rounds. No one would even show up for interviews for the job. See, at sea, a pecking order had been established. At the top, you had the managers. Then it was the servers. Then it was the bar servers, restaurant servers, etc. Guess what was at the bottom? That's right, buses. Anytime I spoke up about how people need to pre bus their tables, people scoffed and said I should just do my job. I explained how I could clear an entire restaurant by myself if everyone pre bust their tables. 30 seconds per table if they did, versus 8 minutes per table if they didn't. Deaf ears. Guys, if it wasn't already obvious, just quickly, a busser is pretty much someone at a restaurant who, you know, cleans the tables, gets them ready, gets all the cutlery out, that sort of stuff, making sure that it all looks nice and is sanitary and ready for new guests to come in and eat. So, I've got to explain about why there's a huge time differential between a pre bus table and a total bus table. If the servers took every plate off the table, even if the table was grotty, I could wipe it into my buckets, clean up a few things, wipe down the seats, reset the center of the table, and move on to the next one. I'd be in and out in 30 seconds and onto the next table. However, if I had to totally bust a table, I'd have to take all of the plates and organize everything on the tab. Now this is time varied depending on the number of people at the table. Two minutes for a two top, four to five minutes for a four person table, etc. If a table had ordered a lot of drinks, multiple fajitas, each fajita meal contained no less than six dishes, and or had been particularly unsanitary about their eating practices, unruly kids usually, you could add up to three minutes per table. This also compounds that I had to go back to the kitchen and sort through all of the plates, cups, etc. Okay, it's all becoming a little bit clear now why this might just be the worst job imaginable. Well, two months into my, we're going to move you off of busing once we find buses, it's a busy Saturday night. I'm talking one hour wait at 6.30 p.m. Half the tables are currently dirty and I'm working my butt off, but each table takes about five minutes because nobody is pre-bussing tables. I'm told the priority is the restaurants, so I had to tell the bar waiters that they probably wouldn't be bussed at all because it would be so busy. They were not having that, and the on-shift assistant manager told me I should do my job, but I should still prioritize the restaurants, not the bar. Whatever, I'm constantly telling servers to pre-bust their tables, only to be ignored. It was a particularly bad night, so I asked if the dishwashers could help me out when I brought back my tabs instead of organizing everything myself. They were nice, so they agreed, and it was a decent system. It roughly cut out two to three minutes per table. Look, it was still pretty horrible with lots of people wanting food, and it still didn't help that I had to go back to the kitchen every time there was a full bus table. Enter Karen, queen of the bar server female dogs. Remember that pecking order I mentioned? Yeah, she was the queen of the server order. She was one of the ones that constantly berated me for my job performance, despite the fact that I did more than almost anyone else in the restaurant. She made my last two months a living hell, constantly telling me I didn't do a good job, that she had to wait for me for too long, etc. I constantly told the assistant managers and manager about the disrespect I received, and they said I should just man up. She never got a single write-up. One particularly busy Saturday night, Karen was a server in the bar side, which meant she wasn't in the priority. 
I told her that I couldn't bus her tables unless she pre bussed them and only if there weren't restaurant tables I needed to bus She was constantly telling me I needed to bus her tables and I was lazy Despite the fact I'd lifted over 300 tabs that night. She wasn't the priority She didn't pre bus any of her tables and she was always on the back dock smoking Once that night a nice couple saw me working on the table behind them and politely asked if they could talk to their server so they could take their order. She'd left them alone for 15 minutes while she was smoking on the back dock and flirting with one of the prep cooks. She scoffed when I interrupted her flirting. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen. I'm sorry I interrupted your sixth flirting break today so you can do the thing you were hired to do. At about 6.30 p.m. that night, the restaurant got flooded with people. One hour wait and I had to push my butt to the limit I was flipping tables despite absolutely zero of the servers pre-bussing. However, since the restaurant was the priority, I couldn't get to her tables at all. Finally, we got a dip. I could finally get to her three tables. And as you guessed, all of them aren't pre-bussed. So I have to do the full bussing for her three tables, despite them being vacant for almost 45 minutes. After the first table, she follows me back to the second table and tells me I need to hurry and I'm garbage at my job and I'm making her lose money. I tell her to leave me alone and don't reprimand me in the front of the house. It was embarrassing with bar patrons looking over their shoulder and I could see they honestly felt sorry for me. I was at the lowest point in my life at that point in time. I honestly felt like I was the worst human being in the world. Once she left, I stopped bussing and sat down at the table for a second. I looked at the dirty, half-full tab and I got up. The table wasn't finished and I left my dirty tab on the seat. I went to the back in to go. It wasn't active and this was before widespread internet. We got maybe 15 orders per night, so the managers had relegated to go duties to the QA that serviced the rest of the restaurant. It was easily accessible for them, but it was also vacant at that point in time. Call in to go was a relatively new and novel concept. I put down my headset, turned it off, pulled out a to go pad and wrote a full note, noting how this restaurant is going to go down the toilet unless the managers get balls and reprimand the staff for treating buses like rubbish. I then left without telling anyone. I was called on my cell phone about five minutes into my drive home and the assistant manager told me, OP, you still have a shift. My response was, no, I don't. I quit. Their response, OP, you still have a shift. Again, my response, no, I freaking don't need to be disrespected like I have. I quit. She had the gall to repeat herself. OP, you still have a shift. I hung up and turned off my phone. It turned out that I left just in time for the dinner rush. Saturdays, we closed at midnight. So for those last four hours, it was hell in a handbasket. I was told that the assistant manager prevented any of the staff from going home until 2 a.m. because the restaurant was basically a trash basket by the end. Wait times at 10 p.m. were capped because they were well over two hours. The host told me later on that she had had to turn away 40 families that night because everything went to hell. Some people just left while waiting for a table. Orders were getting misplaced and more. This information made it up to corporate and they had to call in a fixer team to figure out what happened. They wanted to call me, but I wasn't going to talk to them. As a result of this night, there was some restructuring in the business. The manager got shifted to another position in the company. The assistant manager that called on staff was let go. Karen was wrote up and relegated to the terrible shifts and eventually left. I didn't return for two months, but not as an employee, but a customer. See, I was told all of this by one of the remaining assistant managers, the one that actually treated me like a human being, and he gave me all of my tip shares, which was nice. The next best part about this, the day after I left C, my best friend found an ad that a huge game maker was looking for QAs. We applied that day, and the following week, I got interviewed and hired on the spot. My friend unfortunately didn't make it. It was the beginning of my programming career. I advanced through that job, got over to automation programming, then got hired at other companies. Now, I'm a senior programmer for a sheriff's office with 14 years of programming experience. That is amazing. 
I'm sorry, but that is actually amazing from OP. I, I genuinely want to give you a round of applause. You know and you knew how important you were to the running of that restaurant, especially on a crazy busy Saturday night. It genuinely seemed to me as if you were doing the work of not one employee, but three, four, even five. I mean, everyone else seemed to be on a break, smoking, flirting, whatever. And you were having to fill in, do the job of three people and just, oh, going mental. The balls that you must have, by the way, to say, you know what? I know how much I'm worth it. I know how integral I am to the, the, the future of this business just in this one evening and in future if i quit now the whole thing is going to hell you did it and it did amazing you know someone with less bravery less courage would probably say oh, i really want to quit i'm clearly undervalued here but it's all going to go to rubbish it's all going to go terribly if i do but you knew it would and that's why you quit brilliant scenes Look, honestly if people aren't you know valuing you as, a, as an employee and they're, and they're making you do too much work what a way to go out just show them by by not going to work this is how much you need me. And this is how lost you are without me. I've also got to say the fact that you're now a programmer, that's sick. I mean, that's an amazing job. Sounds a lot more fun than doing this. That's for sure. I mean, when you said at the start, it's one of the worst jobs possible. I thought it can't be that bad. You know, it's only, you know, cleaning tables. It seems okay. Not, you know, that fun, but not horrible. Now I kind of see after reading that story, how horrible it is. But programming, very sick. Well done to you. Good career. Pretty crazy that this is how it started, but um, still very, very cool. Great story. Best friend's entitled mum banned me from seeing him because of my ADHD. I'm a regular teenage boy, but I suffer from really bad ADHD and dyslexia. And having these problems made it hard for me to communicate in a conversation without fidgeting, running out of breath from talking so fast, or just stuttering my way through the conversation. My best friend at the time, I'll call him Jay, was just like me. We did practically everything together. Everything was fine until I came over and decided to talk to his mum for really the first time ever. Hey, how are you doing today? I asked her. Oh, hi OP. I'm doing just fine today. How about you? I'm doing good, thanks. Do you know when Jay will be out? No, not yet. I don't know when he'll be done with his work. Hey, I've got a question. Why do you keep pacing around so much while talking? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't really help it. My ADHD makes me do it subconsciously and I can't think straight without doing it. Uh, yes, you can. Um, I can do what? You can think perfectly fine without walking all over the place. Uh, no, I really can't. It's one of the only ways I can actually be in any type of conversation. Well, my other boy has autism and ADHD and he doesn't have to pace around like that to think. Oh, okay. I see your confusion. It's not the same for everyone. The ADHD works in different ways in every person. She proceeded to scoff at me and turn around in anger. Then Jay appeared. Oh, hey, OP. You ready to go to your house? Um, no, Jay. You haven't finished your housework yet. Uh, yes, I have. Jay replied to his mum. His mum, though, then grabbed Jay by the wrist and proceeded to tell him every little mistake he'd made while cleaning. Yeah, you're not done. And you're also grounded for talking back to me. OP, you need to leave. So I left. And about an hour later, I got a text from Jay saying that as soon as I left, she went on a 30 minute rant talking about how bad I was and that Jay was grounded from seeing me, not grounded from using his phone, going outside, seeing other friends, just grounded from seeing me. He literally got grounded for seeing me for six months just because his mum doesn't like me walking while I talk. Just a little context further, she is just crazy in general. She had her first kid when she was 15. She has eight kids and she's pregnant right now. She's also an anti-vaxxer and won't let Jay get the COVID vaccine. And as you can clearly see, she's just a total Karen in general. Yeah, I mean, that really is ridiculous. Grounding your son because they were friends with somebody who has ADHD is beyond belief. I can't even believe I've just said that sentence. That is absolutely mind boggling. I mean, OP, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Ultimately, like, think about this, guys. OP is probably learning to live or has already learned to live with ADHD and, you know, just accept it's part of his life. He doesn't need somebody like this entitled mum to continue to put him down about having ADHD and make him feel bad about it. What's OP going to think after this whole debacle? Oh my God, because I have ADHD, I can't make friends, see my best friends. Because ultimately, that is what's happened here. And it's so sad to see. It's just a shame because what is this going to do to OP's self-confidence, you know? knowing that because he has ADHD, something that he was born with and literally, you know, can't really help that fact. Because of that, he's being put down by other people. Ah, oh, horrible. Now moving on to our second story. My entitled mum said to me, I didn't put you in therapy so you could use techniques on me. For some backstory, 
I've been in therapy for a few years, and this story is from a few months after starting. I went in due to severe depression and CPTSD caused by life with my abusive entitled mum. However, my entitled mum constantly used it to complain about me to my therapist and try and get him to fix my behavior. However, my therapist was great. And after my entitled mum would leave, halfway through the sessions, we started working on calming and coping techniques for when my entitled mum and I would fight, which was a constant occurrence, helping me to try and stay calm and not lose my cool or escalate things and just communicate better. The incident. As mentioned, my mum and I fight often. So after talking to my therapist about ways to try and stay calm during a fight, I didn't have to wait long before my entitled mum found something to be mad at me for. I felt myself getting angry. However, I remembered what my therapist had said and tried to remain calm. Now, I thought this would help, but somehow this made things worse. I don't remember what the actual fight was about, but I do remember my mum yelling at me. Hello? Why are you so calm? Are you a psychopath? I understand you're upset and I'm trying to remain calm so we can communicate. You're enjoying this, aren't you, you freaking psycho? You can see I'm upset and you're just standing there, all calm. My therapist told me to start working on my reactions when we have a disagreement so that we can communicate without anger. That's what I'm trying to do. I hear your concern and I would like to explain myself calmly. Now I've got this whole thing on autopilot now due to how often she gets mad at me for the smallest of things. I did not put you in therapy so that you could use it against me. You need to fix your behavior, not argue and be a psycho. How dare you use techniques on me? I don't remember much of what she said after that, but the same fight occurred a few times. She often got mad at me for not acting the way she wanted me to. It made me realize that sometimes she just started a fight to take her own issues out on me and not because I did anything wrong. If I reacted to her, we had a fight. If I was calm, we had a fight. If I ignored her, we had a fight. It was generally just a lose-lose situation with her. All right, so let me just get this straight. The reason you're in therapy in the first place, OP, is because of your entitled mother and your life and relationship with her. That's clear to see. Yet she is not happy because you've gone to therapy because of her and are now using techniques against her. I don't understand. So she's caused you to go into therapy and now isn't happy that you're going to therapy because it's having a negative effect on her. It's just, again, like the first story, absolutely baffling. I can't explain that. The only reason you're actually in therapy, from what I can see, is because of her in the first place. Maybe if she was the one who had initially gone to some sort of, you know, parental therapy and learn how to be a proper parent and communicate with her kid without, you know, fighting them all the time, this situation would never have happened. I feel like you didn't need to go to therapy. She should have gone in the first place. And now moving on to our final story of today's episode. Entitled mum demands we kick kid with health problem out of daycare. This one happened before the pandemic started. So the kid in question we'll call Stan. Stan has been coming to us since he was one year old. Stan's a great kid, good behavior, and the sweetest kid you'll ever meet. But not long after he turned five, Stan developed the disorder called gastroparesis that has advanced to the point he'd lost most of the function in his stomach and now required feeding through tubes. So it was early in the morning and the kids were just coming in when I noticed Stan and his parents. This was Stan's first day back after getting his feeding tube. His parents kept him out of daycare for a few weeks just so he could get used to the tube. The first thing he did was run up and show me his tube, bright as ever, smiling and so proud. From what I learned from his parents and the little I could find online, the tubes go up through his nose and down through his throat to his intestines. It looked so uncomfortable, but this boy doesn't seem bothered one bit. He just ran out to play with the kids. Well, the entitled mum of our story apparently had a problem. Just as I was about to gather the kids to head in, the entitled mum came up to me. We'll call this entitled mum Sharon. Sharon must have noticed Stan playing with the other kids. Sharon said, What? is that boy wearing stan carried his feeding tube supplies in a small backpack it's a feeding tube stan has stomach issues and can't eat on his own so he is sick yeah he's having some health issues his parents sent out all the forms to every family explaining this did you not get one i don't feel comfortable with him being here what if he gets my son sick oh my god it's not a contagious disease you can't catch it well, how do you know? You need to remove him from the class. He's not safe. Yeah, that's not going to be happening. He got doctor's approval to come back and he will be staying here. So you're going to put all other kids at risk? 
What risk? It's not contagious. Well, even if it's not contagious, it still scares my son. He can't be here. It's traumatizing to the other kids. Side notes, Stan was actually, at the time of this conversation, surrounded by all the kids who were actually fascinated with Stan's feeding tube, asking him question after question that he seemed proud to answer. None of them seemed uncomfortable in the slightest, including Sharon's son, and Stan seemed to love the attention. They don't seem traumatized, I pointed over to the kids. In fact, it seems like Stan has himself a little fan club. Oh, this is ridiculous. You're putting all these kids at risk. You have to remove this boy or I'm going to the director. I'm not removing anyone and go to the director. She'll tell you exactly what I did. Sharon does the classic entitled mum huff and walked off mumbling to herself. I don't think she ever did call the director as I mentioned it to her the next day and she told me she never got a call. So there you have it. Another tale from the daycare. I mean, how ridiculous is that? The woman complaining that all the kids are traumatized. How about look over at the kids and see if they really are traumatized or not before you say such ludicrous stuff? Because as OP says, all the kids were crowding around Stan, you know, bigging him up, saying that backpack and that shoe is pretty cool, mate. Can I have one? They were, they were, they were loving him. They weren't traumatized. They weren't running away. It's interesting. Stan's become the hero of the class, of the, of the school, in fact. I don't know what this mum was trying. Well, I know exactly what she was trying to do. I don't really know why she was trying to do it though. Like, what's the point? <laughs> is it not bad enough going through this? whole ordeal as a young child to not have another entitled mum just saying no kick him out of the school because he's going to make other kids sick do you know how gastro you know illnesses what how could you ever catch a, an illness that's in your stuff oh my days I'm, I'm about done with this video guys i'm not gonna lie what the hell entitled mum tries to break up her son's relationship because of snapchat i'm a long time lurker of this sub but I finally have the time to post about a certain entitled mum, my mother-in-law. So this happened years and years ago when Snapchat was still a big thing. Can we get a RIP Snapchat in the comments? My boyfriend, now husband, but I'm going to be referring to him as my boyfriend, and I had both downloaded the app. I was 17, he was 16. So something you need to know about my mother-in-law, the entitled mum of this story, is that she basically used to rule her house with an iron fist. Her husband and sons would always cave to her and she would throw a fit if something didn't go her way or if she was told she was wrong. She was also a helicopter parent. So this was one of the first times that I showed my boyfriend that I could stand my ground against her. So my boyfriend and I had been dating for a few months at this point. One night we got into a steamy exchange and started using the app to send each other selfies in our underwear. We weren't fully nude. That is, until my boyfriend suddenly stopped responding. The next day at school, my boyfriend told me that his mum had barged in on him and taken his phone away. He said she caught on to what he was doing and that no son of hers was sending nudes to an adult. Again, I was 17 years old. I then start getting texts from my boyfriend's phone and they sort of go like this. Hey, this is EM. I've taken my son's phone away because he was sending nudes to you. I want you to break up with him. I just replied, no. I leave it for that and go to class. I was pretty angry at this point, mainly because she felt entitled to interfere in our relationship because we teens did something sexual. She then tried to call me several more times knowing full well I was in class. I just ignored it. When I got home from school, my dad said he needed to talk to me. Apparently, the entitled mum called my dad and told him the whole story saying how i had seduced her precious boy into sending me nudes dad who was a conservative christian asked if they were really nudes because he wasn't buying it i explained that we were just in our underwear my dad said he didn't care because that's the same thing as seeing each other in our swimsuits then he told me that the entitled mum tried to bully him into having me break up with her son but he said that was ridiculous I was pretty furious at this point. So the next time I was over at my boyfriend's house, his entitled mum ripped into me. Here's how it went. How dare you send my son nudes? He's only a child and you're an adult. Don't you realize how creepy that is? I'm neither an adult nor did I send nudes. Also, he's only a year younger than me. Are you listening to yourself right now? Don't talk back to me, you female dog. You're a bad influence on my son. Why don't you just break up with him? I don't want to break up with him. 
you have no business in my relationship with him and you're not my mother so i'm not gonna take your advice well then give me your phone i'm gonna delete that god dang app so this won't ever happen again you're not my mum, so i'm not giving you my property the entitled mum is enraged at this point but i just walk away i tell my boyfriend everything and he gets angry and threatens to run away to his grandmother's house his entitled mum then lets the whole thing go but is still very icy to me my boyfriend downloads the app again and we're now a lot more careful about using it there are actually a lot more stories about this woman but that's it for now to be honest with you guys, I actually don't think the entitled mum in this story has done that much wrong. Yes, she's obviously gone a little bit overboard and, you know, some of the stuff she's saying is a little bit outlandish and unnecessary. But overall, she's just looking out for her son. I don't really know why she's putting the blame on you, OP. Ultimately, yes, you are a year older than her son, but come on, 16 and 17 is pretty much the same age. Come on. But still, I mean, maybe I'm giving her too much credit here, but ultimately, her son's done something that is potentially dangerous, sending not fully nude, but, you know, half nude pictures of himself on online which is you know not a good thing to be doing let's be frank and she's just you know a little bit worried about you know why he might be doing that and what's sort of going on there I, you kind of need to look at it from from her perspective in this one i reckon um ultimately it's not your fault that her son is sending images that's for sure it's definitely his fault he has the choice to either stay in a relationship with you break up with you or not send you images that sort of stuff so i don't really know why she's blaming you for it and why she's asking you demanding you to break up with her son surely her son could just break up with you if that was you know what she really wanted and what he wanted but overall i don't know i'm kind of inclined to let this one slide a bit because you know it's just the mother going overboard but but doing what's best for her kid i mean look maybe i'm being a little bit what cringy safe too much strict whatever but ultimately it's two minors sending half naked pics to each other it's not the best thing to be doing is it and you kind of want to say let's not do that she goes a little bit too far as i've said but i think she's on the right lines now for our second story my entitled mother tries to steal my birth certificates so some background i don't get along with my mother she's racist homophobic transphobic and islamophobic among many other destructive characteristics that is quite the list now considering that i'm a queer agender black lebanese person it didn't take me too long to start disliking her she continuously dismisses my racial issues like being profiled while shopping and refuses to use my correct pronouns there's more but this is all that's relevant i'd rather not bore you with all the unfortunate events that is my life so in june 2020 i get kicked out for going to a blm protest which was right after my birthday the very end of may i've been on my own since well fast forward to february of this year i'm in my own apartment working full-time and taking the necessary steps to start college sometimes important mail is still sent to my mother's house and since i don't want to give her my address i'd go pick them up every once in a while i told her to leave them in the mailbox so i could grab and go and hopefully not see her of course i know my mother and i knew she'd probably do something to get me in the house so i slapped some black lipstick on black nail polish and made sure to wear my newly dyed red hair in a way that would give it as much volume as possible those are all things she hates and at one point she even told me i wouldn't get a job with an afro because they're unprofessional yeah she went there so i pull up in the gayest outfit i could find and check the mailbox nothing no surprise there i knocked on the door and asked to collect my mail and despite me calling ahead of time and telling her to get it all together she hasn't even located half of the items these items include w2 forms monthly car insurance and car payment invoices as well as my 600 dollars stimulus check she slowly gets my stuff together and then tries to shove me out of the door before i could ask about my birth certificates i had told her i wanted it as well as my old passport when i called her i quickly reminded her and she proceeded to say something to the extent of i don't even know where they are she has ocd she knows exactly where they are i kept pressing until she caved and pulled out an important document folder we found my birth certificate and a copy of it I start to pull the original certificate out of its sleeve, which then prompted the following absolutely ridiculous conversation to take place. Take the copy. I'll keep the original, said my mum. Uh, no, I'm gonna take both. No, I'm keeping one. No. OP, leave that here. That belongs to me. No. Yes, it does. I want my birth certificate. That belongs to me. OP, don't be like this. Sorry, I'd like to keep my birth certificates. Well, then order one. But you don't need it. Yeah, I do. 
For what? OP, that's for me to keep on record. Why? Look, I'm not going to argue with you. You don't need it. It belongs to me. I would like to keep it. Well, then order one. How about I just take this one? Just order it from the States. It costs money. I also didn't want to deal with government websites. I'd already had enough BS to deal with living on my own. I definitely wasn't interested in adding fight with the government to the list. So why don't you order one then? Because I have one. Again, I'd like to keep my birth certificates. Why? Because I want it. It's mine. Well, it's actually not yours. It's mine. But that's fine. Keep it. Oh, thank you. Finally. The argument was dumb. But despite me expecting her to put up some kind of fight, I wasn't expecting her to behave like that. Not to mention, I plan on legally changing my full name. I need my original birth certificate to do that. But I didn't mention that because then she'd really try and stop me. I took both the copy and the original. But a month or two later, when I was organizing all my papers, I took a closer look at the copy and realized it wasn't even a copy of my certificate. It was a copy of my mother's birth certificate. So it's good I got the original. There were a few times through that argument where I wondered if I should just give up and order one. But my mother's behavior royally annoyed me, which pushed me to push even harder. I actually have a recording of this interaction. If this post blows up, I'll post the recording too. I actually listened to it whilst making this, and the convo is almost verbatim. Also, a bonus thing she said as I was walking out the door, it's hard to be challenged, isn't it? She said this with a big old smirk on her face, and it made absolutely no sense. Now, unlike the first story, this one, yeah, is completely cut and dry. Your mum is being (laughs) nothing short of idiotic. It's not her birth certificate. Surely, guys. I mean, look, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but your birth certificate of your own birth surely is your property. Yes, of course, your parents keep it because you wouldn't own your own birth certificate or, you know, have your own birth certificate when you're just born. So they keep it for a while, but they're only custodians of it. Surely it's not actually theirs to keep. It's your birth. Am I wrong here? It's your birth certificate of your own birth. Surely it's yours. And surely your mum should just say, you know what? Although I'd like to keep it, I guess maybe she would. It's not mine. It's yours. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Good on you for not telling her about, you know, changing your name and all that stuff, because then she probably wouldn't have wanted to give it to you. But well, even more than she didn't want to already. But still, she has no legal right to say I'm keeping your birth certificate unless I'm completely wrong here. And if I'm wrong, fair enough. Hold my hands up. Got that one wrong. But it's your birth certificate. Surely it's yours. I don't know. Be a jerk to fast food staff. Not while I'm here. This story happened two days ago. I live in New York and the latest winter storm was just about to hit. I'm a 25 year old female wearing a big puffy red coat and a black cat with a giant puffball on top, leggings and boots. I'm five foot two inches, 150 pounds. I look like the cuddly teddy bear that I am. Every day I walk to work as one, our car isn't in working condition and two, it only takes a half hour to walk there. Plus, I had weight loss surgery a year and a half ago, so walking helps me get some exercise. I was on my way to work just as it started to snow, and I decided to stop by the Burger King that was on the way. I put my mask on and entered the building to get in line. When I walked in, an older woman was having her order taken, and an older man was standing near the line. We'll call this older man Chad. I asked Chad if he was in line, and he said yes. A few moments later, a man older than him came out of the bathroom and joined him. We're going to call him Kevin. Kevin said to Chad, Did you order yet? Not yet. Still in line. Seriously, can't these people go any faster? I just want my burger. I'm standing there, scrolling on my phone as I wait for the line to move. And I internally roll my eyes. The woman finishes having her order taken and Chad and Kevin move up. I want a burger. Just a plain burger. That's it. The cashier said, Okay, sir. That'll be this much. No, wait. He, he points to Chad, wants a coffee. Medium. Three cream and three sugar, said Chad. Yeah, and please hurry. Chad pays for the order and I step up and place my order. I'd like two spicy chicken juniors with onion and tomato, please. I pay for my order and stand to wait for it. Now the time is about 11.30 a.m. Lunch rush is just coming into full swing, and as I don't have to work until noon, I don't mind waiting a few minutes. About two minutes pass. Kevin then says, Can't these artards move any faster? I just want a goddamn burger. Hey, can I get my food, please? I just want my coffee. They can't even give me that, said Chad. 
The staff ignore them and go about their business, getting food out as fast as they can. The woman in front of us gets her food and politely leaves. The cashier places a small to-go bag on the counter. One bacon cheeseburger. I look around, wondering who ordered a bacon cheeseburger. Kevin and Chad are busy talking amongst themselves about how slow and useless the staff are. A moment passes. Then Kevin says, Where's my burger? I apologize, sir. It's right here. The cashier holds up the bag with the bacon burger. That's a bacon cheeseburger? I didn't order no freaking bacon cheeseburger. I asked for a freaking plain burger. Go and get me my burger. I'm so sorry for the mix-up, sir. I'll get it for you right away. Kevin then said to Chad, They need to stop hiring artards. At this point, I'd had enough. I'm not okay with people being attacked unless they truly deserve it. And these employees certainly didn't deserve it. I turned to Kevin. You need to lower your voice and speak to them with a bit more respect. Excuse me? Have you ever even worked fast food? Frick no. Then shut your mouth and wait for your food. I'm overheating in my coat, trying to breathe in this stuffy mask, and I'm risking being late for work. Yet you don't hear me complaining. These people are exhausted, overworked, hot, and they probably ache all over, and they're underpaid. You came here in the middle of the lunch rush. Did you not see the long line of cars outside when you came in? These employees are moving as fast as they can. Unless you can look me in the eye and tell me you know exactly what they're going through, you need to shut up and learn some manners. You're what, 150 years old? That's plenty of time to learn at least the most basic of manners. With that, I thanked the cashier, took my food and left. I didn't look back to see the look on Kevin or Chad's faces. I'm not good with confrontation and I was shaking from what I'd just done, but I was very proud of myself. I've never worked in fast food. I'd worked in grocery stores for 11 years before I started to pursue my current career in teaching. But my best friend works in a fast food restaurant and I can tell you that they most certainly are overworked and underpaid and customers like Kevin and corporate make them feel like nothing. And I think that's the point right there, guys. If you've never worked in customer service of any sort, be that retail, fast food, restaurant, whatever, you're never really going to understand what it's like. I'm the same. I've never worked in retail or anything like that. And to be honest, for that reason, I know it's going to be horrible. I don't know how horrible it would be. And I can probably understand that dealing with entitled people like this, plus corporate, plus being underpaid, is not a pleasant working experience. So if you're in that situation with an employee of one of these stores, I don't see why you would need to be so aggressive. You just understand their situation. But I can never truly understand it, that's for sure. Unlike Kevin and Chad in this situation, who, who seem to completely, well, at least think they completely understand what's going on. But realistically, like, if you put yourself in the employee's shoes, imagine how horrible it must be dealing with Kevin and Chad. A little bit of empathy, a little bit of sympathy, a little bit of understanding would go a long way and probably, you know, make everyone's days better. I don't really understand, you know, one more thing. Why Kevin and Chad are getting so worked up about their meal being a little bit late? Does it really matter if your meal is a couple of minutes later than what you'd expected? Really? And do you have to abuse the staff because of that? I don't think so personally. Just have a bit more common sense. Now moving on to our second story. Entitled mum thinks that her religion dictates my lifestyle. So my 24 year old boyfriend and I, I am 23, have been dating for three and a half years. His parents have been entitled throughout this entire time. And 100% of this entitlement stems from the idea that if I do not follow their religion, then I am not respecting their religion. For example, when I was first introduced to the entitled mum, this was in a restaurant, she asked me why I'd ordered a salad. I explained that I was vegetarian and that that was one of the few vegetarian options at this restaurant. She told me that not eating meat is haram. I know this is false. I've got several relatives. In fact, everyone in my family except my parents and brother are Muslim. And in fact, the dish she got was haram. Regular, not halal steak. I just changed the topic and hoped that would be it. Of course, it wasn't. Every time I visit their house, she goes out of her way to ensure all of her dishes contain meat. Even the ones that don't traditionally contain meat. Meanwhile, she accuses me of being disrespectful because I'm not eating her cooking. After a few months of this, she decides that because premarital relationships are against her religion, I have to get married. I completely fail to see how those two things are connected, but she started applying a lot of pressure on this. My mum, who's also not a Muslim, but is an expert negotiator, 
suggests that we instead do a Quran reading ceremony with the extended family present. Apparently, this was acceptable to her. So we rounded up the extended family on both sides and watched my boyfriend's grandma, the oldest person in either family, read a verse of the Quran. I didn't consider this a marriage, but if it gets the entitled mum off my back, then great. My boyfriend's mum became tolerable for a while, and I learned to just bring my own food if I ever came over, which was quite rare. So things quiet down for a while, at least on my end. My boyfriend, who still lives with them, still has a curfew of 9 p.m. No alcohol or drugs are allowed in the house. Weed is legal where we live, etc. Despite being 22 years old at this point, oh my god, that's my age! I'll tell you what, guys, if I had a curfew of 9 p.m. and wasn't allowed alcohol, um, that would be astonishing. In the middle of all of this, I get accepted to medical school, which means leaving the city for another city approximately two hours away. I wasn't looking forward to being long distance, but at least I don't have to deal with my boyfriend's entitled mum anymore. Now, she considers being long distance to be the same thing as being broken up, apparently, and then starts bringing over girls for my boyfriend to consider marrying. He tells all the girls that he's already seeing someone, obviously, and it causes an argument with his mum every time it happens. One time, his entitled mum brings him a 16-year-old. With my boyfriend being 22, wouldn't any relationship they have together be statutory R-word? Anyways, at this point, COVID hits and my boyfriend is no longer required to live in that city for school. So he immediately moves in with me. His entitled mum goes full insane. If dating while not married is haram, can you imagine how bad living together while not married is? She gets the dad involved at this point. Now, he's just as religious, but he has to work more than full time. The entitled mum doesn't work and is usually too tired to start anything. However, for this, he'll make an exception. They demand to meet with us in person, despite COVID and the whole region being in lockdown. In a moment of profound stupidity, we for some reason agree to this. Don't ask me what brought on this massive brain fart. Maybe I just used up all my brain cells on the most recent exam or something. So anyways, we meet with them in person and the entitled dad goes on about how ashamed he is when he has to explain that his son is living with his girlfriend that he's not married to. The entitled mum starts crying and explaining that no amount of praying can save us from the depths of hell we've gotten ourselves into. She chooses this time to give a graphic description of exactly how painful hell will be for us, which she quite seems to enjoy. At the end of this, they ask when we'll be getting married. Whenever we want to, I say. The entitled mum goes on and on about how rude and disrespectful I'm being and how I apparently managed to corrupt her previously devout son away from God, etc, etc. This was about a year ago. The entitled mum is trying to make everything about us getting married. Trying to be polite, we invite them over for lunch during a break in the lockdowns. They say not until we get married. I overhear during a phone call, this entitled mum has some questions about the COVID vaccine. And being a medical student, I volunteer to help answer some questions she might have. Not until we get married. I invite my boyfriend's sisters, 20 and 23 years old, but they still live with the parents, to go on a camping trip. But the entitled mum says she won't let them go until, you guessed it, we get married. I should mention that prior to this, I'd never seen a Muslim abuse their religion this way. I get along with my extended family who are quite religious, mostly because they understand that their religion is something about them, not something about me. Oh, that is absolutely crazy. I mean, look, I'm not religious myself personally. I'm an atheist, but I'm all for religion. If you're religious watching this video, good on you. I imagine the majority of people watching are. The only problem that I do have with religion, other than it causing wars and stuff, which isn't ideal, is when people like this entitled mum and even this entitled dad start to force their religion onto other people who don't really care and don't really want to be religious in the same way that you are. I just think it's so strange. Like, if you're religious, absolutely fine. If I was to, you know, Know, see a religious person in the street i wouldn't go oh my god you're religious i'm not going to talk to you that would be incredibly well whatever insert any word there however if they come up to me and start trying to force their religion onto me and say stuff like this entitled mum was saying like you're gonna go to hell unless you do what i say and join my religion etc etc then yeah that's when i think it's a little bit too far everyone should be free to choose what they want to do in life in general. And that, of course, includes religion. I'm an atheist. Other people are religious, the majority of people. I'm not going to try and force my atheism onto you in the same way that I'd hope a religious person wouldn't try and force their religion onto me, which is different, you know. It's calm. The time an entitled kid in my class 
try to choke a classmate. Okay, so this happened in 2018. I was in seventh grade. I have a lot of stories about that year and how a lot of teachers quit. The teacher that was in this situation had quit due to this event and many other incidents. So this all happened because an entitled kid in my class was giving our teacher a hard time by annoying her and doing a Jeffrey impression at her. SML was popular at school at the time and just generally being disruptive. The teacher had had enough and said, go to the office. I'm done with you making my job any harder than it needs to be. Now, at the time, I was watching this all go down. The entitled kid got mad and decided to dump a trash can onto the floor and then started yelling at the teacher about her being a female dog. Then he saw a classmate laughing at a video on his phone. The entitled kid was fuming. He yelled at him, saying, and I quote, You better shut it before I beat your butt. And he went over to him and started to strangle him. Long story short, it took a teacher and a student to get the kid off of him. When they did, the entitled kid was actually punched in the nose and then expelled. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is because my friend sent a video of the fight and said, remember this. I can show you the video if you all want to see it. But yeah, that year was crazy. All right then, guys. So probably I think for the first time ever in one of my Entitled Parents videos, we've actually got a video attached to a story to react to. Let's get into this. All right then. So here is the video. As you can see, Entitled Kid Fight Uncensored. Let's get into this. I think it's the... Okay. I think it's the guy in the yellow, right? The luminous yellow. Hunter. Hunter. It's just going mental. And then it all just kicks off. What? I'm not sure about the videoing. Oh my god. <laughs> but um yeah. There we go. Um, okay then. Yeah, not really too sure what was going on there, but it looked like it was um a lot of fun to video. To be fair, the guy's reaction when he's videoing, like, oh my god, what am I seeing here? Obviously, he's in class. He can't just rapidly pull out his phone and video everything because you know that's not normally allowed. But uh, yeah, I think we could hear that Hunter was getting pretty angry, and I also heard a pretty big bang. I think that might have been when he threw the trash on the floor. But yeah, choking a kid in school not not the not the best idea is it oh and by the way guys for those of you that um are asking about the the goat video if you know about the goat video if you know you know it's from a long time ago it just doesn't exist i would love to say that the entitled mum goat video is coming soon or whatever but i've spoken to the guy who's involved in the situation and he's told me that he's just not going to release the video so i'm sorry to tell you guys i don't think that video is going to be out anytime soon all right then moving on to our second story of today's video unfortunately this one doesn't have a video to react to but i did enjoy that first one entitled mum wants to prevent me from becoming a doctor because i pointed out her son's possible disability i know the title sounds like i'm the butthole at first but please hear me out so as one can tell by my name which by the way is mediocre med student one i'm a med student a couple of months ago my flatmate went abroad for a year She'd been tutoring a boy in English and German. We're German. And the boy's mother asked her if she knew anybody who could replace her while she was gone. As I've done some tutoring before, and I'm fairly good at English and German, my flatmate asked me, and I agreed. When I started, the mother asked me if I could also tutor her son in maths. They used to have another tutor for that, but she'd moved cities recently. I'm not particularly good at maths, but the boy's only in fifth grade. 10, 11 years old in Germany, so I said I'd give it a go. However, it became frustrating very quickly. At first, I was seriously wondering how he even made it to the fifth grade. He couldn't even do basic addition. I could tell fairly quickly that it definitely wasn't due to lack of will or laziness. He simply couldn't understand numbers at all. For example, they were learning about fractions at the time, and he couldn't envision at all what the difference was between 2 over 3 and 3 over 2. I'd heard about dyscalculia before, so I did some tests with him, like asking him to tell time on an analog clock. He was unable to, making him solve a list of addition and subtraction problems in which each was repeated three or four times, different results for all of them. Asking him to tell me which of two numbers is larger, he was mostly unable to, etc. I was honestly wondering how neither his parents nor his teachers had ever noticed anything. I didn't want to keep getting money for a job I couldn't do, so I sat his mother down after a tutoring session and explained to her that her son has such massive issues in maths that I'm in no way qualified to help him. 
I said that he shows a lot of signs of dyscalculia. And while I'm not a professional, and that doesn't mean he has it, I'd suggest having him checked by a professional and organizing a professional tutor. Not some med student who knows nothing about teaching kids with more serious troubles in school. And instead of being grateful that I told her this, she got angry. She told me, and I quote, Get your freaking shoes and get the F out of my house. When I asked her what I did, she almost screamed that she would not tolerate strangers telling her that her son was dim-witted or stupid and that this was a normal and honorable family. I tried to explain to her that I was saying the total opposite of that because her son having that condition would be nobody's fault and that he just needs specialized help, which is anything but dishonorable. That's when she started threatening to call the head of my university because someone like me would be totally unfit to treat patients if I call all of them idiots and that an arrogant dog like me shouldn't be let loose in a hospital. I knew she couldn't realistically do anything, but it still hurt to hear. I didn't reply anymore at that point and I just took my things and left. I haven't actually heard from her again or from my uni for that matter, but I do feel very sorry for her son because it doesn't seem like she'll get him the help he needs. Very interesting one. I mean, surely this has to be a pride thing on the mother's behalf because there's no way that she doesn't know what's going on. I mean, if a kid literally can't tell what number's bigger out of two numbers, then there's something that's clearly, clearly wrong there. And I also don't think that it's the school's fault at all. I'm sure that, you know, any teacher would see this problem almost immediately and definitely bring it up with the parents. They're not going to say, you know what, I'm going to leave this under the carpet and we'll just teach normally. A A normal teacher any teacher would never do that so i reckon the teachers have told the parents what's going on here and that it's almost you know guaranteed that their son does have some form of disability not sure exactly which one it is but there's clearly something that's going on there and i think to be honest it's more than likely that the mother is just you know too proud or or too stubborn or too negligent to say you know what we're going to do something about this and wants her kid to be you know completely normal and just carry on with normal education in a normal classroom it's really sad to see that this kid is not going to get the help he needs because clearly he needs the help and he's not you know dim-witted lazy is a hard worker but he's being let down by his mum in this situation it's crazy and now moving on to our third story who's laughing now i was working in an assisted living facility people who can't really live alone but are mostly independent as a resident care specialist rcs a step below a certified nursing assistant it was well below my skill sets i'm formerly a nurse and a paramedic now with a degree in business administration but i wasn't sure if i was going to stay in the midwest or move back to the east coast and i needed a job One night, I was working with the facility manager's daughter. She thought she was Queen Bee. She'd been caught stealing facility linens and food and treating the residents poorly, etc. in the past. And nothing was done because she was the facility manager's daughter. The special unit required a staff member at all times. The rest of the staff could roam from unit to unit at night. There were four units total. The building was like a big squared off U. Well, of course, she assigned me to the special units. It was just the two of us for the 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. shifts. The special units had a panic button in case that staff member needed assistance in a hurry. As you can guess, poop hit the fan that night, literally. One resident trailed poop from his bed to my desk to tell me he had an accident. While I was turning to him, another resident threw up all over my desk, paperwork, computer keyboard, my phone, everything. Another resident fell out of bed and on and on it went all night. It must have been a full moon that night or something. I hit the panic button several times and she was nowhere to be found. At turnover in the morning, I was explaining all of this to the staff nurse and Queen Bee just sat there laughing. I found out a few days later, she'd been sleeping the whole night and a resident had to wake her up because the buzzer from the panic button had woken him up. She laughed at him and said something about me being initiated and trial by fire and went back to sleep. The dog. Fast forward a month and I've been promoted to resident care director, RCD, of the whole facility. She quit shortly after my promotion. A week or so later, I received a phone call from the RCD of another facility on the other side of my city. He asked for a referral for Queen B. I told him that our company policy wouldn't allow for me to give a favorable or unfavorable reference. I could only confirm that she'd been employed as a RCS and held the state's required certification. 
He kept trying to get me to either give my endorsement or not. I simply repeated that our company's policy would not allow me to give either a favorable or unfavorable reference and she should be happy that it doesn't. He thoroughly understood what I was saying and she didn't get the job. The nurse that I gave turnover to after that shift from heck was in the room with me during the phone call and we both laughed longer and harder than Queen Bee did that morning at shift change. Very clever stuff. That is how to give a little review of somebody without, you know, technically giving them a review. Good stuff because let's be realistic. Yeah, this woman did not deserve a job. I I know she was like trying to do some silly initiation stuff, but ultimately you're dealing with people that need your care and you're paid to provide care for them. She was not doing that and therefore genuinely, and I don't think this is over the top to say, putting these people's lives in danger. What if one of them, you know, had a heart attack An OP was dealing with something else, you know, on the other side of the ward. And this girl, Queen Bee, is just sleeping there? Nah, I think that's very dangerous stuff with old people. You gotta be careful with these people. It's disgusting, I've gotta say. Entitled customer dislocated my finger. Keeps on shopping. Pre-COVID, I worked at a big club warehouse in customer service. The job was great and members were usually awesome. But every now and then, you'd find the most entitled sons of bees to ever walk the earth. Based on the way they treated me and others, I can only assume they don't even see us as human. We were only lifelike robots built to ring up their items and load their carts. One such incident that proves my assumption happened on a super busy Saturday. It was pouring outside. Members were fighting over parking close to the door, then bolting for the entrance as if their lives depended on it. As a courtesy to members, on rainy days, we always had someone outside in the front of the cart return bay to dry off the carts. This day was so busy, members were coming in faster than I could dry carts for them. Most were super nice and patient. They waited in line for a dry one and almost everyone thanked me. A few who were in a hurry or didn't care about dry carts just skipped the line and grabbed a wet one. One such member rushed up and grabbed a wet cart from behind me. Sometimes carts get jammed or snagged together. Usually it's the buckles for the kiddie seats getting tangled, but sometimes it's a warp in the cart from damage. This poor member grabbed one such warped cart and it dragged its buddy with it. The member attempted to dislodge it. He yanked, he twisted, he shook them violently. He looked to me and demanded, help me get these carts separated. I offered him a dry one instead. Nope. He wanted that cart specifically for some reason. I abandoned my drying rag and attempted to pry the carts apart. It was like trying to separate two buffaloes in a horn log. They refused to budge. I looked at the metal flap that allowed the carts to nest into each other. I saw where it was snagged and reached in to coax it free. I placed my other hand on the lip of the second cart to give me leverage while I untangled them. The member demanded loudly, come on, I'm in a hurry. He decided I was clearly too incompetent to separate them, so he reached out to give the front cart one more tug. At that exact moment, I loosened the second cart and the front cart sprang free. It launched forward, catching my thumb between it and the second stationary cart. I heard the pop sound of my thumb dislocating a few seconds before the pain hit me. I yanked my hand free and managed to stifle my choice profanity with less fireable words. It was actually sucking sticks of saffron on a ship. My supervisor witnessed this and still tells people it's his favorite outburst. This member just looks at me like I'm nuts. There, all I needed was a cart. Was that so hard? I'm cradling my oddly shaped hand. Sir, I think you broke my finger. The member just shrugs, huffs and walks into the warehouse. He looked like he forgot I existed the second he took his eyes off me. My supervisor witnessed the whole thing, but was more worried about me, not the member. He pulled me aside and radioed for ice. Lucky or unlucky, I am very pain tolerant. It's not actually the first joint I've dislocated. I also know the easiest way to end the pain is to just reset the joints. So I fiddle around with my weirdly dangly thumb until I feel it click back into place. My whole thumb was swollen and turning a lovely shade of purple, but it was back in place. My supervisor got me sent inside to write up an incident report. He sent a posse of employees into the store to find the member and sentence him to banishment. But as it was insanely busy, they never found him. By far the worst customer ever. Well, at least I got an extra day off and a great macabre story out of it. 
Well, OP, that's amazing that you can look at it like that. I mean, this whole story sounds horrible, to be honest. This guy, especially. It's so weird. He's such a stubborn person. He doesn't even care, let's be honest, about the car itself or, you know, whether it's wet or dry. I mean, who wouldn't want a more dry car in that situation? Of course, he would want a, a drier car rather than a soaking wet one that's been out in the rain used by other people recently. But his own stubbornness was telling him, no, I have to have this car purely because uh, this person can't untangle them and neither can I. But I need this car. I need to untangle them and use this sopping wet cart just because I'm so stubborn and I don't know anything better. Well done, mate. You caused a serious injury. Good on you. Okay, then moving on to our next story. Had a bogey on my tail in the parking lot. So deploy flares. So this happened about a day ago. Honestly, I'm still getting a few random giggles thinking about it. This feels like a pretty good example of entitlement, but I apologize if not. Anyways, I have a local grocery store near me with a decent sized lot. It doesn't usually end up full, but I guess yesterday was crazy for reasons I've yet to care finding out about. There was no space and drivers looking for spots that had even less patience. I got in well enough to the store to do my minor amount of shopping, exiting with barely two bags full of snacks and sandwich makings. As I exited, a few of the hovering parking spot snipers were following people from the doors to cars. A guy in a large hatchback tagged me and slowly followed me. Usually, I would dip between cars to the next aisle over, and they don't bother to follow because it gets a little creepy then. I don't like people willfully hovering behind me like that, even less so when in vehicles. Nope, not this guy. He guns it around the aisle and back to me to follow my path. I jump across again, pretending I was an idiot who forgot where I parked. Guess what? Follows me again. This next time, I'm far more blatant about shaking him off, and I double back. He promptly lowers his window and shouts at me. Just find your freaking vehicle so we can both be happy. He doesn't even give me a chance to reply before rolling his window up again. I figure my bags aren't that heavy and the cold was enough so that my sandwich meat was fine if I took a bit. So I began wandering aimlessly, letting the guy think I'm finding my vehicle when I knew exactly where it was. He cursed at me a couple more times and seemed to think he was my designated replacement to a spot. I didn't time it, but I believe he hung on for 10 grueling minutes of my wandering before gunning it hard out of the lot, going straight through a four-way stop and garnering the ire of several drivers. No cops, unfortunately. The funny part, as I left, I could clearly see a few scattered spots he could have taken if he weren't so obstinate or driven by pure spite. The best part though, I walked to the store Oh my god, no way, that's insane. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. All that time you're telling me you had no car and you were just doing it to mug him off. Genius? Well, what can you say about this man? Genius, intellect, 2 million IQ, uh, an absolute legend, a man that doesn't care, a mad lad. I could keep going because that is just brilliant. Well done to you. Just making this entitled person look like an absolute mug for no real reason. Brilliant scenes. Um, and to be fair, it kind of was karma because why track someone around a parking lot when there are other spots opening up? Honestly, the similarities to our first story are ridiculous. There are other spots to go in. There are other dry carts to take. Just take them. Don't go for the one you were going to go for in the original spot just because of spite, just because you're too stubborn to understand that it would save you time just to go and get another car, go and get in another spot. Why? I don't get it. Just these people are so stubborn, man. And now moving on to our final story of today's video. Karen, he's taken and not into you. So let's set the stage. I am Ellie. My boyfriend is Tom. Tom's friend is John. John's fiance is Jane. And Jane's sister is the Karen of this story. Don't worry if that's a little bit hard to follow, guys. It will all become very clear and obvious. My boyfriend Tom and his friend John had been friends for years and hung out quite often. John had lost his first wife and infant son in a car accident years prior. Oh my God, John, I'm so sorry. John had found love again in Jane and would bring Jane along. Jane is now his fiance. Tom was also starting to bring me along to events. Lately, Jane's sister, Karen, was also starting to tag along. Karen also had two children from two prior marriages and could not afford babysitting, so she'd bring them along. This prevented us from doing adult activities and talking about adult topics. I'd also notice Karen constantly giving me a chronic female dog face look. Then she seemed to make every excuse to be around Tom. Once, Jane's car needed new spark plugs. Tom's a pretty good mechanic, so he offered to change them for her. Right behind Jane was Karen. Karen would also make every excuse to get between me and Tom 
and get me away from her kids. She also started to give me faces that said, stay away from him and you're the only reason why I can't have him. After John and Jane got married, John and Jane wanted to take Tom and I out to dinner, a double date. We made sure it was just the four of us. Well, 10 minutes before dinner, we got word that Karen and her kids would be joining us. At the dinner table, I had to play a math game with Karen's son. Tom was doing the same with her daughter. Out of the blue though, Karen yells in my face, no math at the dinner table, but left Tom completely alone. I later asked Tom if he felt that Karen was trying to hit on him and Tom said yes. Tom assured me that he had no interest in Karen and even if I wasn't his girlfriend, he still wouldn't have an interest in her. She's just not his type. He wouldn't even consider her as a friend. The only reason why he treats her as a friend is because she's John's sister-in-law. Now, if Karen was a teen or someone in her early 20s, I would have just brushed this whole thing off as immaturity. But Karen was a woman in her mid-30s. Over the course of a year, things progressively got worse. Now, aside from tagging along with John or Jane to see Tom, Karen was now coming to Tom's place alone. Tom kept brushing her off, telling her he was busy. Karen, though, never seemed to get the memo. We would even blatantly mention the book and movie he's just not that into you during conversations. At one point, I was even afraid she was going to try and hurt or kill me just to get to Tom. Finally, one day, Karen showed up and Tom's mum was also there. Having known what had been happening, Tom's mum confronted Karen. She said that Tom and Ellie, OP, are together and that Tom has no interest in her. If she shows up unannounced one more time, she will help Tom and I file a restraining order against her. She also said that she had a black belt in karate. She does. And that her husband has a nice arsenal of guns. He does. And isn't afraid to loan us some. Tom also called Jane to tell her that the next time Karen showed up uninvited to a get together, he and I would be the ones cancelling. Although Karen stopped showing up unannounced, she became super friendly with Tom at parties and get togethers, especially when I wasn't there. John had a birthday party at Karen's house. I couldn't attend due to work. Tom told me that virtually the whole time, Karen would follow him and offer him a seat, even in the middle of the hall. For those of you wondering why Tom didn't just tell Karen to knock it off, Tom doesn't like confrontation. Tom's also a large guy, 6'5", 300 pounds, but he's a gentle giant and quite a softy. He doesn't like people thinking he's a big and tough guy, so he doesn't show it. Quite often, he did mention to Karen that he had a girlfriend and was happy with her. Like me, he assumed a twice-divorced 30-something-year-old woman would know better. He also talked to John and Jane about Karen. Jane said she would handle her sister, but we're assuming she never did. Why? You'll find out next. This story has a very twisty end. John and Jane divorced after 18 months of marriage. When Jane and John first met, Jane had a lot of credit card debt. She had a sob story about how it was to help her mum. After they got married, John helped pay off all of the debt. After the debt was paid off, Jane started maxing out their credit cards and transferred a majority of the money in their joint bank accounts into her personal. Then she walked out and filed for divorce, leaving John with all the debt. No Jane meant no Karen. We later found out Jane never actually changed her name to John's last name, even though she claimed she had. Looking back, Karen was probably going to do the same thing to Tom. Fortunately, Tom wasn't interested. Tom and I have since gotten married and started a family. Uh, okay, wow. Um, I was not expecting that ending. That is mad. So all that time, these two girls were literally just trying to, you know, get with random men, steal their money, and then get out of there. Holy, that is crazy. Marrying just for the money, by the way, on its own is mad. But marrying to ruin someone's life, max out all their credit cards, then take half of their money anyway for, you know, the divorce, and then leave them completely in the mud having to deal with all the debt that you've accrued from maxing out the credit cards. What sort of villainous evil sisters are these jesus i mean genuinely i think jane is more of a karen than karen herself because to be fair we don't even know if karen was going to do the same to tom but it does seem quite likely that they were probably working together and probably conniving to get as much money as they could from two fake marriages wow you're just lucky i guess that tom wasn't interested at all and he sounds like a great bloke because my god if he'd been swindled that's his life ruined. I hope John's okay, by the way. My, oh, a horrible thing to go through. I feel sorry for that lad. I hope he's okay. I hope he's recovered. But wow, what a horrible pair of girls. I banned a girl from a slide. Mum got in my face and called me slurs. 
Okay, first, a little context. I work at a water park roughly 30 minutes away from my house, and I got my job from being friends with the director and having another friend in the business. But don't think for a second that I don't work. I'm the second hardest working person there, and I've received employee of the month twice in the single year I've worked there. So I knew people there, and people liked me. I don't particularly like kids, but I can handle them well enough. The water park also had two sections, the kids side and the adult side. This story takes place in the kids side of the park. All of my fellow employees hate working the play structure. It's got a slide and kids are annoying. So I decided to take it for the day, take one for the team, you know. So I was up in the play structure and my job was to send kids down the slide when it was safe for them to go. This little girl comes up to the top and wants to go down. I wait a second until I see the other kids start to get out, then turn to tell the girl that she can go. But she's already halfway down the slide. She nearly hits the kid because he was slow to get out. She comes back up and I kneel down and say, hey, that was dangerous. You could have hit that kid and both gotten hurt. Please wait for me to tell you when it's safe to go down the slide She nodded and actually followed my instructions But this is when she broke the rules again At the entrance of the play structure, there's a sign that gives the rules Wait for the worker to let you go down before going down the slide And you aren't allowed to go face first She decided to ignore rule 2 and went down face first She came back up again, so I knelt down again and said Hey, you can't go down head first, you could hurt yourself she nodded and then went down head first again anyway the play structure works on a three strike system so as that was her third time breaking the rules i had to kick her off the slide so when she came back up and started to walk towards the slide i stepped in her way and said i'm sorry you broke the rules three times so you can't go down anymore she yelled at me and tried to push her way past but i'm bigger and stronger than her so she couldn't get through and went back down the stairs in a half a solid 10 minutes pass. Then she comes back up holding her mother's hand. Her mum says, relatively calmly at first, My daughter told me you told her she couldn't go down the slide anymore. Is that true? I said, that is correct, mom. She asked me why, so I explained that if a person breaks the rules three times, they can't go down the slide. She gets closer to me and says, Okay, I understand that, but she's four years old. I respond with, Mom, it doesn't matter how old she is, she still broke the rules three times, so she can't go down the slide anymore today. She gets even closer and says, Okay, but she's four. I respond with, I understand, but the rules apply to big kids the same as they do for the small kids, so she can't go down anymore today. Now, I'm 19, close to 20. Relatively tall, not super muscular, white and gay. A lot of people tend to notice that last one, since I don't try to hide it. You can usually tell based on my mannerisms and the way I talk. Another thing is that I deal with severe anger issues and based on trauma from my childhood, people being in close proximity to my face makes me incredibly uncomfortable. This lady was maybe an inch away from my face when she started yelling at me and calling me a freaking insert homophobic slur here. I was so close to losing my cool. I could actually feel my face turning beets red. My hands were balled into fists and my jaw was incredibly tense. A bit more about me. I might look like a scrawny white kid, but when I get angry, I look like a demon. Not my words. I wasn't even doing anything and I was terrifying her daughter. In an attempt to keep my cool and to get this well out of my face, I said, Mom, please don't call me slurs. It's uncalled for and rude. I'm only doing my job. To my surprise, she actually got out of my face, scoffed and said, Let's go find someone in charge. Apparently she had a day pass because I saw her later that evening talking to my manager. She looked over and saw me cleaning and I just hear, That's him! My manager, Herm, who hates me by the way, comes over to me and asks me if I assaulted this woman's daughter. I of course said I didn't, but because he's a rampant butt, he went to look at the cameras anyway. He saw that I was right in what I did and that I did everything according to procedure. We then went over to talk to the lady. She said, well, is he in trouble or not? Herm looks at her and says, he never did anything wrong and he never assaulted your daughter. Then he gets this strange look and asks for her day pass. At first, she refuses to give it to him, then relents and gives Herm her pass. It turns out she wasn't even supposed to be there. Her pass had expired the day before, but she just didn't leave the hotel. So I had the privilege of escorting her to her room, waiting outside while they packed, and then escorting them out of the building. She was cussing me out the whole way out of the park, in front of her four-year-old daughter, no less. Mum of the year, everyone. As we got out to her car, right as she got in, I said, Thanks for coming to the park. Feel free to never come again with the biggest grin on my face because that was my first Karen. At least it ended well. When I got inside, my manager told me that I handled the situation very well and I had a pretty uneventful end of the night. So please remember not to be rude to the workers 
because we're often right. Yeah, it is pretty mental the amount of times that customers think they know the rules better than the people who literally are paid to work there and are paid to know the rules of the place. It's strange, but it is quite funny at the same time. Gotta say, you did handle this very well. You kept very calm. I think I would have got a lot more angry in that situation. Some random woman coming closer and closer to me, telling me that I don't know the rules and telling me her daughter's age over and over again. I don't care how old she is. The rules are the rules. OP, well done. He did the right thing. You know what shows more than ever that you did the right thing? The fact that your manager, who you said hates you, was just forced to back you up. He was even like, oh, I kind of wish that you had done something wrong. But no, you acted perfectly. Good stuff. My entitled mother told my husband he is used to being accommodated because he is disabled and that he caused my depression. I was unfortunately raised by the type of entitled parent who would take me and my sister shopping for hours and then take us through a drive through once we were exhausted and hungry and get herself a coffee, but nothing for us. I need my afternoon coffee. The kids don't always get something when the family goes through a drive through She was a special kind of entitled, and I'm pretty certain she has several undiagnosed personality disorders. Anyways, I knew my husband since junior high, but we didn't become close until we were adults. He has a rare genetic condition that limits his mobility primarily. He's in a wheelchair, but can walk somewhat. And when we started dating, he had much more mobility than he does now. Of course, my parents went through their own emotional roller coaster about me being serious with someone with a disability, but eventually came to terms with it and became major fans of my now husband. They always were doting on him, telling their friends how wonderful he was and heaping on the pressure for us to get engaged. Fast forward to our married life. Unfortunately, since my husband can't work and relies on SSI, I was the sole income earner. But the SSA regulated my income, touting that if I made too much money, he didn't deserve or need the help anymore. So the federal government pushed us below the federal poverty level with their restrictions on how much income I could bring in. And at the beginning of our marriage, I didn't have a lot of resources on getting help caregiving for my husband, as all of it was new. So my already chronic major depressive disorder went from bad to worse. And I went to the hospital in September of 2019. We ended up getting home health aids for my husband by sometime in 2019. But all the stress of the poverty and the difficult first year of marriage had taken its toll on my mental health. Not to mention that my husband's home health aids were a revolving door in the home. In 2020, we got a good aid. And then guess what? COVID happened. So everything locked down. We continued our financial struggle but we were making life work. Although I did have another major depressive episode in the fall of 2020, but I managed to stay out of the hospital thanks to the help of my support system, my family at the time. While my husband was a beacon of hope and sunshine in my life, my mother was a constant stream of negativity, criticism, and manipulation. When she wasn't trying to control me or criticize me, she was talking about things that I had no interest in and had no social awareness to pick up the cues that I wasn't interested in what she was talking about. In our conversations, she started to speak negatively about my husband on a regular basis and i was getting frustrated she would say little things like he isn't leading you as your spouse or he needs to support you more in your depression and i didn't like the way she was talking about him naturally i would talk to my husband about the things she said as i was frustrated and he started to feel resentment towards her by the time christmas was coming around i told my parents that they needed to come over and resolve things or we weren't coming to Christmas morning. So my parents waltzed into my living room and made themselves comfortable for what would turn out to be the fight of a lifetime. I started explaining that my mum had been making several negative comments consistently about my husband and we wanted to talk about them and work them out. I said that we were upset by the things she'd been saying and that we did not want her to speak that way about him. Instead of responding to the comments that we'd made, she went on a long speech about my husband. She said that he caused my depression, which had gotten worse since we'd gotten married, and that he was used to being accommodated because he was disabled. She said that he wasn't the spiritual leader of our small family, and that she was worried about your marriage. She continued on and on, but after she said the worst of her speech, my husband became furious, understandably, and went into another room. He'd been faithful and supportive of me in my episodes of depression in the last few years, and he'd given me a lot of stability and comfort in those difficult times that I was going through, but my mother couldn't see any of that. How can we work anything out if he's gonna walk away? My parents exclaimed. We were trying to express to you the ways that you hurt him and he didn't listen or apologize. You were on a complete tangent where you said even more terrible things about him. I cried in defense. Well, I just want you two to have a good marriage and I just wanna know that he's doing 
everything he can to support you in your depression my mother wailed he's been my rock in these hard times he's the reason i haven't given up it's not right for you to say these things to him i know my husband if you don't apologize and say exactly what i tell you to say i know he will never speak to you again my mother was terrified so i told her the exact words to say and i told her to say nothing else I went into the other room to get my husband. He was so angry and I had to convince him to give her a second chance. He was yelling and he's a calm guy, but he came out and she said what I told her. And that was that. They made up well enough. But from then on, my husband hated my mother. By March, 2021, both my parents denied that she said any of those things. Like literally denied. She actually said, I never said he caused your depression. It was bizarre gaslighting. And that's when I knew I could never trust her again. So I didn't. We started to do less and less with them over the year. We still went to the obligatory family functions, but they were so stressful. My mum wanted everything just so. We had to be the perfect family to make up for what we weren't when we were growing up and what she hadn't had in her childhood. And then my friends started suggesting I do less with my family. So I decided to cut my parents out. And then the hellstorm started. My one sister told me that I was morally obligated to have a relationship with my parents forever because they raised me. I was like, nope, none of that, thanks. So my sisters were always fighting me to come back to my parents. That was stressful. I went all the way until July, 2022 without seeing my parents at all. And then I saw them at my cousin's wedding. 2021 to 22 had been a rough year for us. My husband had declined in health and had had a major mobility loss. He was no longer able to self-feed or toilet, get in and out of bed or open doors, in addition to the other things he'd been unable to do before that. It was a lot of grief for him and for me as well. When we were on the trip in July, my parents had a conversation with me that I found rather disturbing. Would you ever consider putting your husband in a care facility? It seems like there is so much pressure on you. Things are challenging right now because there aren't any A's to pick up all the hours he is eligible for. And we could use more help, but we have things working right now. I wouldn't want to put him in a facility unless I had no other option, especially since a Medicaid facility would not take good care of him. But we had one friend who put her husband in a facility, my dad said. And when she did, she would always go and visit him every day. Honestly, I was kind of relieved when she put him in the facility because I felt like she got her life back. I could not believe that they'd suggested putting him in a facility. At the time, I didn't piece together the insensitivity of their suggestion. But after speaking to my mother-in-law about it, I realized that even in a best case scenario, they were giving my husband zero consideration. They had volunteered in nursing homes before and my mother had made pleas to us when I lived at home not to put her into one. And yet they thought it was perfectly acceptable to put my husband in a facility when we had wonderful care accommodations for him in his home. I really believe that my mum is an ableist. Some of my other relatives remember her making comments when we were engaged about how I needed to entertain him because he couldn't be helpful. My husband now has a hernia and has to have surgery, even though surgery is very dangerous for him because of his condition. She offered to sit with me during the surgery. But for some reason, I feel that it's less about us and more about what she wants. Either having a relationship with me again or looking like the devoted mother at her son-in-law's surgery, being supportive. My whole family talks about how she's changed because of this 12-step program she's in. Could have fooled me. Yeah, screw that. She's clearly very ableist. It doesn't matter if the person that your daughter is dating or is married to is like, you know, got everything possible under the sun wrong with them. If they love them, who cares? That's love, baby. And that's also very cringe. But forget about that. It is kind of true, you know. It's just weird to me. Like, you know, surely how happy that this person makes your daughter. And yeah, you know, your daughter's not an idiot. She knows it's going to be tough and it's getting tougher. But it's her life and she's chosen to do that. Why are you trying to take that away from her? It's very strange. I would only want my children to be happy. But for some reason, people on the subreddit tend to not want that. It's very baffling. Lady says I look like a slut. So my supervisor said, Okay, so the other day at my job, a museum, I was on welcoming team duty. Basically, we welcome people at the entrance and check tickets, answer general questions, and give directions. I was there with two colleagues. Little detail that's important later. We have radios and headsets to communicate with one another and our supervisors when we have to share important information. Like, okay, there's a man with a service dog, papers are in order. Usually with that one, we gush over how cute the doggo is over the radio. So that day, I was welcoming visitors 
visitors when this woman walks in I go to welcome her and ask to see if she already has her ticket to scan it I say hi in my overly chipper customer service voice as I approach and ask for the tickets She doesn't say hi to me She just stops and gives me this once over look and stares at me very intently She stares at my face and says to me Seriously, you work in a museum and you come here looking like a slut She was referring to my makeup I have a uniform, but it's really dark and dull and I look more goth than wednesday adams in it We can't dye our hair, but there's no rule about makeup So I tend to do very colorful bright eye makeup with glitter and shiny eyeliner because I like color It was the first time anyone had ever said anything negative about my makeup style I kind of froze because sure sometimes people complain about stuff But to have someone walk in and the first thing they say to be a personal insult That's a first so I tell her that no one at the museum has ever objected if anything people love my crazy makeup and they even give me challenges like finding a way to combine all colors and make it look cool and that there's no rule about makeup whilst looking at my two colleagues for backup they were standing by and listening to the exchange i see one of them with their hand on the microphone ready to ask for help gosh i love them the lady continues it doesn't matter you should know better when you work for a prestigious institution than to come here looking like some slut drag queen Gosh, you millennials, not even my generation, but whatever lady, have absolutely no class or respect whatsoever. I want to see you held responsible. This is unacceptable. So I get a hold of the microphone and ask for a supervisor to come down to the entrance right away because someone wants to speak with them. One of them says they're on their way, but ask what's going on. And I answer honestly. There's a lady who said I look like a slut and that I shouldn't come to work looking like that. There's a second of silence and they ask if the woman really said that to me. My co-workers talk into the radio and they say that indeed, that's what she said. What my supervisor asked me to do then, I think I will remember forever. They tell me to remove my headset and hold the radio to the woman's face, which I do. Then, through the radio, they tell that rude lady... Our museum does not tolerate any rude, insulting, or threatening behavior towards our employees. Leave now, or the next person you shall speak to will be the head of security. Her face went completely white. Just complete shock. And she did end up speaking with security and was escorted out, swearing that she would sue us to non-existence. Just her face when she heard that message through the radio, that scene will live in my brain forever. Mental, who knew that wearing makeup made you a sl- Sorry, I just have to censor myself there so YouTube don't demonetize me. You're very professional though, I've got to say. You handled it very well. Your supervisor's a legend, but goodness me. Imagine coming into an institution and just instantly calling out one of the workers for wearing makeup. Why? My entitled brother likes to steal my beer. So I bought the worst tasting beer I could find and left it out for him to take. Not long ago, I posted about how my brother went out of his way to follow me when I tried to go camping alone. Him and that crazy vehicle he calls the Mini Ram that he made by cutting up a minivan and adding all sorts of other mods. Now, my brother has stolen beer from me before on previous camping trips because him and his friends always drink too much and never buy enough. And when he followed me to my camping spot with his own camper a couple of weeks prior, he tried to steal a six pack from my fridge. And he acted like a big baby when I made him give it back. So I thought up this little gem of an idea. But it was no easy feat as my brother would drink just about any beer so long as it gets him drunk. To try and find a beer that was truly nasty, I started asking around and buying different brands. After a couple of weeks, I hit pay dirt. Now, I won't say the brand name of the beer, but it was bad. There was so much hop to the flavor that it made me shudder every time I took a swig. I could barely finish one bottle without puking because it made me gag so much. So this stuff was perfect. Also, I know some people really like that kind of overly hoppy beer. I'm not trying to offend, but to me, it was just horrid. I started openly talking about going camping again in my favorite area and getting my friends to join in. My brother easily got wind of this and decided he wanted to go camping too. He showed up with his mini ram and camper about two hours after I'd got onto the campsite. Only this time, he didn't try to park next to me and instead went to the next spot about 100 yards further down the road. My friends and I partied it up in our own way. Played music, danced like idiots around a fire, played stupid games, all the usual. And knowing my brother, he and his friends would run out of beer at some point and try to mooch off us because they have no concept of drinking in moderation. They didn't bother us on the Friday night. But on Saturday night, around 1 or 2 a.m., my brother hobbled over asking for beer. 
we all just ignored him like he wasn't there which made him get an attitude one of my friends brought his big cooler and was keeping all our good beer and food in it and we kept the cooler near us or locked in my truck at all times inside my camper i left two full six packs of that horrid beer in the mini fridge my brother just grabbed them and walked away He acted like he was being sneaky, but seeing a drunk man act like he was invisible was just hilarious. About half an hour later, my brother came hobbling back and looking sick. He started demanding to know what was in the beer I bought. I started asking him what he meant because I didn't give him any beer. He looked flustered for a moment and then finally just said he took some beer from my camper. I asked if it was that brew and he said yes. I laughed and said that stuff was terrible and he could have it. I even pulled out another six pack that was minus the one I drank when I had tested the beer and I tried to hand it to him. He looked like he wanted to throw up at the sight of it and just left. Then just to be extra petty, my friends and I snuck over to his campsite after a little while and left the remaining six pack on top of his cooler. He and his friends were all wasted and actually still drinking the nasty beers that i tricked them into stealing and their faces all showed how bad it was every time one of them took a swig it was followed by rbf but they were so drunk that they probably wouldn't even notice there was more of that same beer my friends and i watched from nearby as they kept drinking and making sour faces my brother eventually puked on himself and then ran into the river to get the vomit off himself he threw up some more in the water yeah it wasn't a pretty sight even though we could barely see him in the dark but we could still hear him. He repeatedly threw up with his face in the water and made loud gurgling noises, then cursed my name over and over again. That's when we finally had enough of watching them. I didn't see my brother or his two friends again until well into the afternoon. They were all badly hungover, and despite how much they drank, they couldn't forget that nasty beer they had the night before, especially since the bottles were littered all over the ground. My brother actually demanded that I apologize and I just laughed and said, you actually want me to apologize to you for stealing beer from me? And then we all just started laughing at him. He left humiliated and we didn't interact again. I drove home before he did this time and he's not spoken about what happened to our parents and I've heard nothing from mutual friends. I guess this time he wants to keep his humiliation a secret. I think next time I'll get some beer spiked with laxative to leave for him. That might be funny. Yeah, that is when you know you're absolutely battered. When you're drinking drinks that taste disgusting, but you keep drinking them. You vomit and you still keep drinking. Um, I do feel for the bloke in this situation and his mates, to be honest, because it's him that was the one that's stealing it. Honestly, he does sound stupid enough to get caught by the same trick twice. And if you were to put laxatives in your beer and then just leave them out and maybe he'd take them, maybe he wouldn't, you wouldn't be doing anything wrong there. Like the beer is your possession. You can do whatever you want with it. It's up to him if he wants to take it or not. You know, nothing wrong with it. You know what I'd actually do, which is a little bit less harmful than a laxative in a beer. I'd probably go with some non-alcoholic beers, right? And just give them to him and just say, yeah, enjoy, pal. Maybe you'd have to like redo the labels or something. But I wonder how many beers he would have to drink to realize that there's zero alcohol. But I know placebo is a strong thing, but surely at some point he'd be like, okay, what is going on here? Leave in the comments how many beers you reckon it would take for him to realize that there was no alcohol in them. I want to hear your thoughts. Entitled co-worker called the cops on me after I had to make moves to evade a road rage driver. Please note, for the information of everyone who is going to mention seatbelts being mandatory in their cars, my passenger was an intoxicated petite female co-worker I did not know very well. I am very much larger than her. Yes, her not buckling up was a safety risk, but I judged that risk to be less of a problem than potentially winding up in a confrontation when it was just us in an enclosed space. So, earlier tonight, I went to an event my boss holds once a month, where everyone shows up to a fancy restaurant and has dinner and gets some human-to-human interaction, which my boss apparently felt was lacking. He pays for it all, and I'm a fan of the food. Less so the people, but I feel like that's life, and college wasn't so long ago that I'd turn my nose up at a free meal. The co-worker in question found herself without a ride home and several drinks in after her ride had a family emergency and had to leave my car's cheap to run so i offered to give her a lift home it's worth noting that i'm in no way shape or form a speed freak i lost a loved one in a car wreck and i'm sure as heck not going to be doing that to someone else just so i can get an adrenaline rush now my co-worker is the sort of girl that when anxious does not stop talking like i'm not sure how she's able to breathe with how much she talks For the most part, I don't mind. I just focus on following GPS directions and getting her home safe with an occasional agreement noise thrown in. Then, a wild BMW with a hair up his butt decides he wants to play games. I'm not aware of anything I did other than drive a fancy electric car that could have drawn his ire 
But on a highway that did have a small amount of traffic, this idiot started to orbit my car. He'd come up on the left, cut in front of me way too close, brake check, then drop back on the right and pull up so close he'd smell the exhaust if my car had any. I had no idea what this dude's issue was, and I had absolutely no idea if he was on drugs or could come close to cashing the checks his balls were writing around my car. I also had no desire to get into a car accident. The entire time I'm realizing how dangerous this situation could be, my co-worker is just chattering away. I kept trying to get a word in edgewise and I couldn't, and eventually I got sick of waiting and just cut her off in the voice reserved for when poopers hit the fan. Courtney, buckle up and please be quiet. I need to concentrate for a minute. She buckled up, but did not shut up. Huh? What's going on? What do you mean you need to concentrate? Is it that BMW? Are we in danger? I should call my boyfriend. Panic was rising in her voice at the same time, and I was stressed out enough that I just said, shut up. Then I hit the button that saves the last 10 minutes of dash cam footage on the off chance we got pulled over and waited for a moment where the road was mostly clear ahead of us. I saw the chance and took it and we shot off like a rocket. The BMW tried to pursue, but if my baby's got anything in excess, it's definitely acceleration. We took off and the first chance I got when I couldn't see the other car's headlights, I took an exit. Total time to evade, less than a minute. Did we hit triple digits? I can neither confirm nor deny. Was it safer than letting that idiot keep doing what he was doing or risking him following us off the highway? You're dang right it was. As soon as we were off the highway, I pulled over for a minute and apologized for what had happened and explained my reasoning as best I could. We were actually only in exit early, so we just took back roads to her house and she got out without another word. I felt kind of guilty because she was crying the entire time after we got off the highway and that was a little bit scary. The drive from her place to mine was uneventful until I rolled down my dead end street and saw a police car waiting for me. I had the delightful experience of a field sobriety test in my own driveway, which I passed. I gave the officer a Cliff Notes version of events with the footage to back it up. The officer was not surprised by what the dash cam showed and said I shouldn't make it a habit and to have a nice night. Okay, so I guess that your co-worker did call the police on you pretty much immediately and said, go and check him out. He's been driving dangerously. Why? Surely she understands what's going on. Yeah, you broke the speed limit, but as you said, it's something that you kind of had to do. Otherwise, you would have been in even more danger. I don't know legally what happens there, right? Obviously, you've still broken the law, but then you would have been stupid not to do that in that situation and potentially get into a car crash that you know could have ended horrifically i actually don't know the rules like did the police give you the benefit of the doubt when they look back at this dash cam footage it seems like they did but yeah if you do know for sure let me know in the comments down below interesting i guess you know never see of courtney a lift again that's one of the conclusions you were being nice the whole time i don't get it you explained why you did what you did but no she called the police on her co-worker good from her now if you enjoyed that last post you're going to want to stick around for this one because it's written by the same user a different event but again it involves some dash cam footage and an interesting car journey i suppose you could say the climax was electrifying off the cuff i will assure everyone reading this that the dash cam footage referred to in the post has been super duper deleted and the police are the only ones with a copy of the video i was feeling rather hungry for dinner and craving pizza so i did what anyone does and ordered one i then got my butt in the car and drove to get it because i was hungry en route to the pizza place i was behind a rolls or a bentley one of those super expensive and fancy British cars that are more intended as a status symbol than actual transportation. Said fancy car had super tinted windows and was being operated rather erratically all over the road, swerving now and again, and then drifting to one side before swerving again. I stayed a good distance behind the car because I might have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. Driving behind this car for a couple of minutes, just watching and waiting for something to get here, and the car swerves off the road and drives straight through an electrical box on the side of the road. One of the cabinet-sized ones. Not the, if you go through this fence, you can forget ever having kids, Transformers. A mighty startling boom and a little bit of a light show, as electrical cabinets are not designed to be impacted by negligently driving automobiles. The two occupants of the car pop out as if they've been shoved out by some unseen force two teenagers as a matter of fact a boy who was presumably driving who also found his pants around his ankles and his underwear around his thighs and a girl she wasn't wearing a shirt but was wearing a certain substance on her face which will go unnamed i start cracking up because who the frick does that at rush hour never mind so badly I call 911 and report a car accident, but I keep giggling because the pair are now arguing with each other. The dispatcher seems rather alarmed why I'm laughing at the same time that I'm calling in a car wreck. I think about explaining what happened, but I just decide to say, I'm sure the responders will understand. Both occupants appear to be unharmed beyond some seriously damaged egos. The man on the other end just goes, 
Okay. I grab a gag gift t-shirt that's been kicking around in my back seat since I don't know when and some napkins and get out the vehicle. The pair are still going at it hammer and tongs. I can't freaking believe you crashed my dad's car, says the girl. I wince at that. I freaking told you to stop, cries the boy. Just shut the frick up and give me a shirt, demands the girl. No way, it's freezing, says the boy. It was roughly 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Charmer. Oh, wow. Apparently that's 16 degrees Celsius. Very comfortable temperature. I cut in with a, excuse me, miss. And she turns around at me with a furious expression that turns beet red when she realizes exactly what she's wearing. Yes, she asks, suddenly covering her exposed lady parts. Here, I toss her the t-shirt and then take a step closer and hold up the napkins. For your, uh, and I motion at my face. She makes a squeaking sound and turns an even brighter red. I already called the police. They should be here soon, I say, and walk back towards my car. It was too difficult to keep a straight face much longer. By the time I get back to my vehicle, two cruisers pulled up and discharged two officers. They surveyed the damage. You could see a measure of what the actual on their faces. One officer approaches the pair and the other comes to me and asks what I'm doing. I tell the officer that I've got the whole thing on dash cam. I pull up the footage and the cop watches the erratic driving, the final fateful swerve and the state of the pair. He groans and covers his face with a hand. Can I get a copy of that? He asks. By now, a fire truck and an ambulance had rolled up and several people had walked over as looky loos want to do. I've also shown the final swerve and subsequent car exit to the other police officers, some EMTs and several firefighters. The looky loos weren't invited. Muffled laughter seems to be the order of the day. The first cop comes back over, retrieves his thumb drive and tells me to delete the clip. Both occupants are underage. I move to comply, but just before I hit the delete button, I look up at him. One last time? He cracks a smile and nods. We watch the final sequence one last time, and then I delete the clip and tell my car to format the drive. Best I can do to ensure it stays gone. The pizza place was a little angry that I was so late for my pizza that they had to make another, but they did very much enjoy hearing the tale of why their power blipped a half hour before. Honestly, can you imagine being these two kids when they have to go home to the girl's dad and explain exactly what happened? Like, what detail do you go into? Like, when your dad asks you, okay, guys, exactly what happened? Tell me exactly everything that happened as to cause this accident. How much truth are you really going to tell him? And also, is there any danger? that the police could let him know because you are minors i don't know how it would work like if he asked them what happened are they at right to tell him that could be a terrible terrible conversation i mean the car crash is one thing but the reasons to why it happened is so much worse oh god i've just realized as well there's no way this kid is on the insurance jesus that is a very expensive car whether it's a rolls or a bentley oh, goodness me <laughs> that is like the worst thing that could possibly have happened um and on top of that yeah the napkins nuts and i've actually just reread the title i suppose you could say the climax was electrifying it all makes sense now good stuff op really enjoyed those two stories entitled teacher tries to tell me i don't have epilepsy because i don't have grand mal seizures i have epilepsy it's very weird like i don't have grand mal seizures very often but i get absent seizures and those seizures where you shake but don't convulse all right for people like me that don't know what grand mal seizures are here's a definition on screen a grand mal seizure causes a loss of consciousness and violent muscle contractions it's the type of seizure most people picture when they think about seizures okay well this happened when i was in high school all of my teachers knew about my absent seizures including the karen teacher i'd just been put on oxycarbazepine generic for trileptal and the main side effect was having seizures more often i had an absent seizure in this karen's class and my friend who sat next to me yasmin began to try to snap me out of it the following occurred and i was told by yasmin later what exactly happened the karen teacher said op why aren't you doing what i told the class to do yasmin replied on my behalf she has epilepsy she's having an absent seizure just just let me get her back to reality. Well, my cousin has epilepsy and convulses when he has them, so she doesn't have epilepsy. And she's just faking it. If you don't do what I assign in the next moment, OP, you'll have detention. Miss, she sent a massive email to all teachers about her epilepsy with doctor documentation that she does indeed have it. You can't send her to the office for detention for a medical issue that she has no control over. I so can and I will do when I see fit, Yasmin. If you don't like it, you can go with her. Now, to notes, I've only had two two grand mal seizures in my life. One when I was 16 and one when I was 18. I haven't had one since then, thank God. 
but I definitely have epilepsy. Well, I'll report your butt to the Board of Education if you try and do that, miss. That's not her fault. At this point, another student gets involved. Yeah, she's got a medical condition, miss, so therefore you can't send her out by law. He'd been doing college classes for a lawyer career path. But this Karen continues. OP, wake the frick up now, you lying dog. You don't have freaking epilepsy. At this point, the teacher reached to touch me and Yasmin and the other student both jumped up and guarded me. As with absent seizures, you don't touch a person when they're in one. Yasmin had another student go and get the principal who took the teacher to his office. And then I snapped out of it, thank God. This Karen was actually fired for intimidating students and trying to touch a student without their permission. Recently, she found me on Facebook and berated me for getting her fired. It was wasn't me it was yasmin's dad that did and causing her own kids to be taken and put into the foster care system because she didn't have money to care for them well it turns out that she got her kids taken because she didn't believe that her youngest had an allergy to peanuts and purposely packed them pb and j sandwiches for lunch to prove that her daughter was faking the allergy her daughter could have died from anaphylaxis you see stories like this are the reason why it really annoys me that youtube removed the poll option on videos because in my opinion this story is probably fake but i have no idea i mean i know from my personal experience that teachers can be mental and the more i think about it the more i think that maybe this actually did happen listen get in the comments whatever you think obviously there's no way to validate this but i wanted to bring it to you and see what you guys thought i wasn't sure when reading it let me know down below do you reckon this story is real or fake let's carry on entitled woman tries and fails to take my job so i'm an instructor at a small college i teach artsy vocational classes but i only have an mfa and my school really favors more academic phds this was all told to me when i was hired but the dean at the time was incredibly kind about this and gave me a secret boost in pay to make up for the lack of favor she told me that even though i would never be promoted my area of expertise was valued and as long as i stayed in my lane i was very welcome so before i even got tenure i worked for a few years and developed a slate of very popular classes that filled every semester i was very happy and grateful to have the job titles mean nothing to me and i was just happy to be successful at a job that i loved that helped people i also learned very quickly never to step on the toes of more senior faculty i stayed in my lane then a woman was hired in another subgroup of my departments i never met her nor was i involved in her hiring she had nothing to do with me but she does have a phd now before i even met her i saw on her social media that she announced that she would soon be teaching all of my classes and she was delighted to be doing that i was shocked because i went through a rigorous hiring process and i'm exceptionally qualified to teach in my area she has no publications in my area and her degrees are only vaguely related to my area i figured my chair would put her in place but i was wrong instead i was called into the chair's office and told our new hire is very interested in what you do and wants to help you i stared my chair down she's got a degree in x but was hired to do y that doesn't have anything to do with me ah well her degree is multidisciplinary and she is more than qualified this shocked me because it was way out of protocol there was a pecking order one that i'd followed i also realized very quickly that if i gave in i'd have no job i'd be shunted off to teach stuff i wasn't qualified to teach this gave me the courage to resist and resist i did multiple meetings with my chair followed in which i was painted with the difficult and unsupportive words honestly if the woman had one shred of business teaching in my area i probably would have succumbed to the pressure but she wasn't qualified either by degree experience or publications and that made me mad meanwhile an older colleague who'd been terrible to me and made me cry a few times pulled me aside one day apparently she'd grown to respect that i wasn't letting the chair bully me she told me to never verbalize permission for this new hire to take over any of my classes apparently the rules of the school were and are that i was the one who decided who could sub for me or take over for me so i held firm i was bullied over and over again one time my chair very nearly physically threatened me and said why can't you just say it the chair had no idea that i'd been tipped off as to why i needed to not give permission i was told by another colleague that this new entitled teacher is bored with her area and doesn't like what she got a degree in and she only did that area because it's easy to get hired i said her life choices weren't my problem and i stood firm again my chair threatened not to support my tenure but i actually had a bulletproof application the chair couldn't do anything i was shunned by many colleagues some of whom i thought were friends i was called angry and unreasonable on a good day a female dog on the worst one day the sweet dear lady who'd been responsible for hiring the new entitled teacher actually cried an apology saying she was sickened by what was happening to me the woman had been their last choice and the only person they could get this sweet lovely woman wailed 
told that she was obnoxious and terrible She also said that many people in the department supported me but were scared of the chair She said I should just keep resisting at least twice I was at school events and when I told the person both times a higher-up administrator what I did and taught They said oh, I thought the new hire did that. I had to correct them So I got tenure and stood firm Meanwhile, a former student who was now teaching at a community college nearby told me that the new hire for our school was teaching there. Luckily, that didn't last long. She didn't have the expertise, so I guess the gig just fizzled. Now, one thing I never did was meet with this woman. I was asked to so we could hash things out. And I said repeatedly that there was nothing to hash. I was happy in my job and my job wasn't her job. I was always polite and professional if I had to deal with her, but I always avoided any potential traps. They wanted my verbal permission and I wouldn't give it. Finally, the chair stepped down. The next chair initially sided with the majority because he didn't know me very well, but then he got to know me and was very fair. Eventually, the woman stopped trying to do my job. She pushed her way into another area and now she steers clear of mine. It really did take about 10 years though to wear her down. So there was no real dramatic ending. I just held firm and eventually she gave up. The reason I'm sharing is recently another colleague told me that he always thought that that woman and the chair were having an affair and that this is why everything happened. Maybe I'm naive, but the thought never crossed my mind. Plus, the woman is actually not attractive at all, so I couldn't picture it. Anyways, over the years, whenever that entitled woman has done anything terrible or stupid, my colleagues will always share it with me. Still, I actually have little ill will left for her. I won most of the battles and the war, and that's good enough. I still love my job and my students, and I'm glad I fought for it. They say academia is the Game of Thrones without the beheadings. Fair, I think. Sorry, I did not realize how long that was going on. When you said you've been doing this and fighting her off for 10 years, that is unbelievable commitment. I mean, fair play for her as well. She kept trying to go at this for 10 years, trying to steal your job. That is how you know that she's probably entitled. The fact that you kept up with this and made sure that she wasn't going to get it and you stood firm in front of loads of people trying to tell you to leave, trying to force you to leave. Yeah, elite from you, crazy from her. My boss knows exactly why I'm quitting my job. Okay, so first a bit of background. I started my current job half a year ago. It's nothing fancy, but a legal job in a governmental agency. When I was employed, there were plenty of red flags. I couldn't negotiate my pay with HR and was asked, well, do you want the job or not? So I was placed the lowest graduate pay. My new boss, let's call her Karen, also informed me that she was skeptical of men because they have a tendency to have a peacock attitude. In the trial period, Karen was joking about her right to have me dismissed without a reason. Yeah, that made me feel great about the work. Anyway, I started the work and quickly discovered that there's a lot of stress in the workplace we've had a lot of resignations people calling in sick and last minute tasks the three remaining in my function are covering the work of seven people my function requires me to travel very often so imagine getting 20 hours notice that you have to travel for eight hours on your weekend having a 70 hour work week though the contract says 40 and never being able to do our daily tasks because there's always an urgent task it is a mess and due to people resigning all the time we have to do a lot of overtime work especially those of us who hold a law degree with frequent travel to other parts of the country now my colleagues are amazing and we do have a lot of fun but we are stressed all the time and colleagues break down crying due to the stress from time to time now my boss karen is actually quite nice but she should never have been put in charge of this department due to her boss being nasty to her she'll often take it out on me and my colleagues after six months of verbal abuse i started checking out the job market i was quickly offered a job closer to my speciality with less overtime and a massive jump in my salary 40 percent i accepted it on the spot and called karen to resign she took it sort of well in five minutes she was through all the grief stages denial you couldn't already have found a new job anger who stolen you from me? Give me his name and number. I didn't. Negotiation. I'll match the pay. I told her that she can't, but I agreed to not take my store up vacation and get it paid out instead. Depression. You've been the biggest success story in my employment that I've had. I can't replace you. This is saddening. And then finally, acceptance. Okay, it's closer to your interests. I'll miss having you working with me. Now all I have to do is to work through my 30-day resignation period. I can manage it. A few days ago, we had an extraordinary seminar on well-being and stress at work. Yes, that is how bad it is here. We had to talk in groups and in my group was Karen, another colleague who was resigning and a recently promoted colleague. My recently promoted colleague made the point that with better well-being, better communication, respect of the work-life balance and less stress, the retention would be better. 
but Karen knew better. No, no, these two guys aren't quitting because of stress and lack of well-being. They're part of a generation me first. I can't blame them for being a part of an unfaithful generation that doesn't respect the workplace and is ungrateful for the chances provided. Yep, she really said that. You know what? I might take the last week off now. I'm done with Karen. We've both told her why we're quitting, but she's not even respecting our reasoning. Instead of making it a problem that we don't live to work, but work to live. I mean, come on, even at that point, the most stupid person with their head in the sand would realize that the turnover rate is as high as it is for a reason. And it's not just because of the generation. It's obviously an internal issue. It's not that hard to get. Like when you're at a work event and literally two of the people on your table are resigning in the next few weeks and then you're explaining to somebody, no, it's their problem, not ours. Yeah, surely at that point you look at yourself and you think, ah, maybe something's gone wrong here. Like, what am I doing? And by the way, I'm not blaming the Karen entirely for this, by the way. Like, OP has said that they have a lot of pressure from their boss and above. It's a company-wide issue, but it definitely needs sorting. And it's definitely a company issue. So that's what discrimination feels like. I've recently discovered that sitting in a chair all day, every day can have a detrimental effect on your lower body. Places like lower core, hips, and glutes. Happily enough, my gym offers a trainer-led class that targets that area specifically. I also happen to know for a fact that promotional material for said class exclusively features females in all the pictures. I checked the signups for it and it's listed as one I can register for. Sometimes there are specific classes for age or gender that just won't appear in my feed. So just to double check that it would be okay for me to participate as a guy, I went to talk to the staff last Friday about it and actually wound up talking to the seemingly nice woman who leads the class. Spoiler, she's a bit of a sadist, but in a good way, if you catch my drift. I mentioned my particular problems and complained a little bit about how frustrating it is trying to get stretches done based on what you see on a video. Her response was, and I quote, Oh goody, a special project. I'll put you up front with me to make sure your form is perfect. I mentioned that sentiment being terrifying and she said, and again, a direct quote, Oh, you have no idea. See you Monday. This statement was punctuated with the gleeful tiny claps that some people do. So Monday, class time rolls around and I show up. It turns out the class is being held in a yoga room, which is heated to 80-something Fahrenheit and kept fairly humid. I'm a few minutes early and it's just the trainer and a few other girls chatting in small groups. And there's a collective glance and questioning look from everyone but the trainer, who seems downright gleeful now. She's like, oh good, you're here. I'm talking with her about what the plan is and seeing exactly how unflexible I am when the entitled parent of the story enters the room. The door swings open and two women enter talking to each other. One lays eyes on me and freezes. What is he doing here? The trainer explains my dilemma and says it's a one-time thing. I'll be in the front with them, etc. But the woman is not having it and keeps complaining. But she does also enter the room, saying she's not comfortable and really thinks it's better that I leave. At this point, I'm considering drawing a hole on the floor, climbing inside of it, and then pulling the hole in after me, Looney Tunes style. The trainer and the entitled parent are going back and forth about it. And then another person enters. A startlingly pretty man wearing a purple yoga unitard who came in with a big, Hey! and immediately ran over to the different groups and started giving air hugs and kisses to a fair portion of the girls present, greeting them by name, including this entitled parent. Now, when my anxiety levels spike occasionally, I'll reflexively make a joke to try and cut the tension because it's that or scream. So when the new guy elicited an actual welcome, I just blurted out, oh, so that's what discrimination feels like, huh? The new guy looks at me, winks, then looks at the trainer and goes, oh, I like him, isn't he a cutie? I replied, I think I need an adult. And everyone in the room but the entitled woman laughs. She just mutters, or you could just leave. After that, the trainer asked her to step out as she was becoming a disruption. But this is supposed to be a safe space, the woman declares. The new guy came to the rescue. Honey, it's supposed to be a safe space for everyone, not just us girls. Look at him. He's a lot more scared of us than we are of him. The woman looked around the room, saw that she was getting no support, and huffed herself right out. The class itself went a lot longer than it should have. It was only supposed to be an hour, and only an hour went by on the clock. But it felt more like at least three hours for me. My whole world is pain. And then OP is actually updated the morning after. I knew nothing of pain writing yesterday. Oh my God. Yeah, that's that doms for you. Enjoy that, pal. Also, before people call me out for this not being real discrimination or me not knowing what it's like, I realize I'm incredibly privileged to be a straight white male. 
I don't discriminate. I'm well aware I have no idea how hurtful it actually is, and I was not trying to make light of the concept. I just felt so uncomfortable that I blurted out the first joke that came to mind. Yeah, valid point, and I agree with it entirely as a straight white male myself. But I will say, you actually were discriminated against. That is discrimination. People are saying that they feel uncomfortable with you in the room for no reason other than your gender when you can be whatever gender you want in here. There's no rules. And yeah, I'm not for one second like OP saying that this discrimination is worse than what other people from minorities have to suffer with. Of course not. But it is discrimination nonetheless. Gotta say, the man that came in, absolute legend. And second of all, your joke was funny. So overall, great story. Fair play to you. Entitled mum thinks we control the weather. I was formerly employed at a large Orlando, Florida theme park. You know, the one with the mouse. Backstory. This takes place in the middle of July. And if you've ever been in Central Florida in the summer, you know it rains pretty much every single day between 3 and 7 p.m. In my role, I carried a radio like a walkie-talkie. This day, I'm in one of the parks going to a location to perform my job. And as I'm walking through the park, the skies open. I mean, it's like buckets of water being poured out on you. I enter the location and see lots of people in ponchos and rain parkers standing around. I rarely perform my duties in the parks when they're open. When I do have to go in the parks, I usually walk with my head down, hoping no guests stop me. However, this wasn't the case on this day. Here comes the entitled mum. She walks up to me madder than a hornet. She stands in front of me, huffing and puffing, and demands to know when the rain is going to stop. This is how the exchange took place. Um, sir, when is this rain going to stop? My children would like to enjoy the theme park. Mom, I can't be certain, but there are storms usually in this area every day. But you're ruining my kid's vacation. Excuse me, mom? I say for years to bring them here and all it does is bleep in rain. This is all your fault. Mom, there isn't anything we can do about the weather. Mother nature is a fickle lady. This is where she goes off the rails. That's BS. I know you have some kind of way to stop the weather if you want. You people are just understaffed and can't accommodate the people here. What have I just read? I can assure you that is far from the case, mom. We want all of our guests to have the best time because if you don't, you won't come back and visit with us. You guys are the reason we're here. She then gets in my face, I mean nose to nose, and says, Go frick yourself. Make it stop raining. Get any little radio and you better call someone to find something else. I am not the most patient person in the world and I could feel the anger boiling inside me i had to disengage myself from the psycho entitled mama or i would lose it and my job when there are really bad thunderstorms like the one we were experiencing that day we would get random weather updates on our radios just then the alert sound for an impending weather update came over my radio i excused myself from the woman and stepped away to listen to the weather updates the person said the thunderstorm would exit property around 4 35 p.m I returned to the entitled mum and said this in the most sarcastic way I could, knowing I would probably get in some kind of trouble. Mum, I just spoke to God and he said the rain would be gone by 4.35pm. But shockingly, the entitled mum looked at me and said, thank you. I just stood there with my mouth open and I took this as a sign for me to exit the scene. Flash forward about an hour and I'm still in this park. The rain stopped, the sun was back out, and it was humid as heck. Just out of the corner of my eye, I spot the entitled mum, and she's making a beeline straight for me. I think to myself, great, it was nice working here. She says, thank you for calling someone so they would make it stop raining. I have a, huh, what? Look at my face and just say, huh? I knew you guys could turn it off. I still have a hurt what look on my face and I just mumble, you're welcome, mom. I walk back to my work truck laughing the entire way. All right, that is just the icing on the cake. The fact that she actually thinks that you physically stopped the rain and it wasn't just natural is incredible. I I love this woman. You know what's crazy is that now this woman is going to tell the story for the rest of her life of the time at Disneyland where she forced an employee to literally stop the rain so her kids could go on the rides incredible now if you like that first story you're gonna love this one why is there no snow so i saw someone else post recently about a lady asking about changing the weather and it reminded me of a similar story i manage a motel in a very small rural town that blows up during the winter as we live next to a mountain without a doubt every year it would snow during winter over the town but this year we were not graced by it A guest who checked in the night prior came into the front desk the moment I flipped the open sign and started nonsense ranting. When her ranting was finally over, I gave her a moment to potentially say anything else and then asked, I'm sorry, what's the problem? Why is there no snow? On the mountain, I assure you there's plenty. No, no, I mean down here. I don't want to drive my kids all the way up the mountain for snow. Well, unfortunately, it seems we haven't had any reach down here. The mountain will most likely have had their snow 
snow machines working though to help accommodate But I don't want to go up the mountain I want the snow here so I don't have to drive my children all the way up there I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do to assist with that matter then change the weather Uh, the the weather? Yes, change the weather. I brought my kids here for the snow. How would you like me to change the weather? I don't know, get one of those stupid machines to spread snow down here or something. Yeah, I don't believe that I'll be able to arrange that. We'll figure it out. At this point, I knew we were both yelling at brick walls and I really needed to put food in me as I didn't have enough time to have breakfast before I arrived at work. So I calmly said, if you would like snow, then I'm sure there's some in the freezer I can scrape off and hand to you in a cup. No, this did not satisfy her. Yes, she was very angry and left a very heated and slightly deranged review. And yes, I laughed very hard after she stormed out complaining to the heavens that life was very unfair to her for not giving her snow. And there you go. Just like London buses, you wait ages for a story to come along about a Karen that wants someone to physically change the weather and then two come along at once. Incredible scenes. I mean, genuinely, like we've seen some stupid stuff over the course of my channel, right? And on this subreddit in particular, but like changing the weather or literally asking somebody to change the weather. It's got to be right up there, doesn't it? I mean, it's top three, that's for sure. Entitled abusive brother-in-law wants to drop his daughter at my home whenever he feels like it. My husband blames me for not allowing it. I am Shannon, a 33 year old woman and i've been married to my husband tony for 13 years we have a daughter janelle who is 12. it's been a very rocky 13 years because of tony his brother miles who is 31 and their family let me give you a little backstory in 2020 miles was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and the family has done nothing but enable it he started arguing with Janelle, my daughter, while she was talking to his mother, her grandmother. I came out of the room because I heard it in the hallway and he was literally facing down a six foot two man, a 10 year old girl threatening to put his hands on her because she talked back to him. I stood between him and told him he's not going to put his hands on anyone. His mother tried to quiet him and get him out of the house while Tony is sitting outside on the porch listening to everything that's happening. I asked Tony why he didn't do anything and he said his mother had it under control. I was seething and couldn't believe it. A month later, Miles comes with his daughter, Jessica, who is six years old. I'm in the shower and I hear him arguing with my daughter, saying, I'm gonna put my hands on you. Your father and mother can't do anything about it. I immediately came out of the shower, but he was gone and Jessica was there. I told Janelle to put her clothes on and that we're leaving the house. I called my husband and told him we're leaving, but Jessica is in the house. Miles returns and sees us waiting outside for an Uber. He starts berating us at the top of his lungs, calling us all kinds of names. We quickly got in the Uber when it came, but Miles came up to the Uber and punched the window on the side I was sitting, telling us to go. I called the police when I arrived at my parents' place. They took my statement, gave me a report, and then left. I heard that Miles was harassing people in the streets after we left, berating them in the same way. I told my husband that Miles needs to be taken to the hospital or else he'll end up in jail or worse. He told his parents and they did nothing. Instead, they took him in where they were working and were watching him. He saw my husband come by and Miles then slipped away from them and came to our house. After things escalated drastically, the police were called and he was taken to jail. It is now 2022 and I've not seen any of them, Miles or his family, since that incident. My husband's birth family has been trying to get us to be around them when we'd rather swallow hot coals. Mother's Day, Miles asked my husband if he can bring Jessica to see Janelle out of the blue. I almost choked because of the audacity and said no. I told my husband that no one has apologized or atoned for anything, including him. Jessica told me in 2020 that her father told her not to trust me and that I don't love her. It hurt her because she said she told them that I do love her. I've had her since she was a baby on and off. How could I not? I also told him that in the future, his mother can bring her by when we're ready. A week later, when I went to a store two blocks away, Janelle's grandfather brings Jessica and Miles over. Her grandpa usually locks the door and she goes out to greet him, but this time, Miles and Jessica were at the door too. Janelle had a panic attack while Miles apologized for his past behavior and tried to give her a hug. Janelle said she was sick and backed up. Jessica, however, came in and spoke for a few minutes with her. My daughter called me immediately afterwards in a panic, telling me what happened. The way my heart dropped into my toes and rolled around, it took me less than five minutes to be back home. Once again, I called my husband and told him what happened, then had him put an extra bolt on the door. Today, my husband calls me and asks if Jessica can stay for a few hours. I said, no, you have to give me a bigger heads up. She can come by next Saturday. About a half hour later, we, me and Janelle, hear a knock on the door. I check by the window and see Jessica and her father. Now, I'm confused because I definitely said next Saturday, 
Plus, I don't want Miles here for obvious reasons. They leave after a while. Then my husband comes home while I'm once again in the shower. I hear a little voice after I turn the water off. And who's in the kitchen? Jessica. I told her, hi, baby. You can come next Saturday. We're going to have a fun day. All the while, Tony was ushering her out the door. I asked Janelle how she got in here and she said that Tony had brought her inside. While my husband was leaving, I told him to make sure the doors are locked because I don't want anyone coming in here. He said nobody is trying to come in here and I mentioned his brother knocking at the door. Clearly, he had no idea. Then he said his brother was leaving Jessica with him. That's impossible though, because he was at work. He's staring at me intensely and I asked if there was a problem. He starts shouting at me, saying I'm being stupid because you don't want Jessica to come over. You're holding on to the past. He's making it seem as if I just don't want her to come over and that I want to keep her away from Janelle. I tell him to get out of my face and go. He continues to shout and then proceeds to bump his chest into mine. I'm still naked, fresh out the shower. I tell him to stop before I call my brother. He tells me to call him, knowing he'll do absolutely nothing if my brother were to show up and continues harassing me. I told him if he touches me, I'm going to call the police. He said, call them for what? Then proceeds to poke me passive aggressively, trying to egg me into retaliating. I continue to tell him to leave and he has to go back to work, so finally leaves. My mother thinks I should drop it and let Jessica come over whenever. When I know they just want a free babysitter, plus I don't want to deal with these issues anymore. Nah, sorry, it's your house, your rules. You can do what you like. If you don't want someone to be in your house, then that's absolutely fine. That's on you. Also, it's not as if you're just saying, I don't want you in here for no valid reason. Like this family has caused you so much stress and made you so uncomfortable and abused you. Let's be realistic here. It makes complete sense what you've chosen to do. And yes, definitely stick by it. I've got to say though, it's not just Miles that's abusing you. Tony, what what is he doing? I mean, that's physical abuse at the end right there. What is he doing? He is a mug. Are you sure you want to be with him? Now, we do actually have a little update from OP that I'll put on screen right now. Here we go. Janelle and I have taken some of our things and are currently staying with a friend. We live in New York. We left after Tony went to work today. I'm open to options and looking into the best next steps from here. My daughter is very intelligent. She knows that what Miles and Tony's family is doing is wrong and is very outspoken when it comes to them, which they don't like. Then OP says, thank you so much for your responses. I'm overwhelmed in the best way. Thank you for validating that I wasn't overreacting and actually abused on level i didn't consider especially from my husband that's what i'm saying it's not just miles it's a problem you gotta look at your own family too my mum would text herself things she thought i was saying about her as proof to ground me when i was 13 my family decided to no longer have a relationship with my mum, and that also meant cutting themselves off from my little brother and i I completely understand why now. When I got my first phone, my mum would have me turn it into her at 7 p.m. I wasn't allowed to have my phone with me at night. If she noticed a text chain was missing, then automatically she assumed it was because I was talking about her. When actually I was talking about embarrassing sexual fanfics with my friends. When this happened, my mum the next day would come into my room showing me some random number texting her, saying I was talking to my aunt, my uncle, or even my dad about her, who I never even talked to my whole life. I'd always tell her this never happened and she'd just take my phone. I'd realize later that she would also start texting my friends and even boyfriend later on, acting like me. That is mental. She would do this all throughout high school, playing the victim card and running to me crying. I was so confused, wondering who the frick is getting me in trouble like this all the time. I would comfort her and tell her I never said any of this, but she never believed me. In college, my freshman year, she was arrested for identity theft again and didn't have much time to fight me on her delusions. Junior year, a political movement started and me and her were both on other sides of the movement. I hated coming home because I wanted to avoid politics, but she would always say some ignorant stuff and I'd always have to correct her. I texted my friends back at college how much I really despised my mom's mentality because one day we got into a big argument. That day, she comes into my room saying, look what one of your friends sent me. Another random number telling my mum that she's racist and claiming to be my friend. This was the best part. I looked at her and said, none of my friends sent that. I just asked them all and they all said no. She asked if I was going to deny it and I told her, no, I said that. I was telling my friends how dumb you are. She started crying right in front of me, asking why I would say such hurtful things about her to my friends. I think in that moment, I had a realization. My whole childhood and teen life, this psycho was texting herself mean things she thought I was saying about her to make me feel guilty for things I never did. She wanted me to beg, cry, tell her how much I love her and tell her those were lies. 
the minute I denied it, it broke her. It's been two years and we do not talk anymore. A few days during no contact, she would text me on random numbers saying she was going to ruin my life. I would screenshot this and show it to my brother and he would tell me, oh, that's mum crying because that same number is texting me mean stuff too. So she never really stopped her bull different number now but i just feel silly that she did this my whole life and it took me so long to realize i mean yeah maybe with the benefit of hindsight it becomes obvious but you know that's your mum. inherently you're gonna trust her because that is just a natural biological thing i don't really know if you can blame yourself for that in fact i definitely wouldn't i mean clearly she's just a very strange woman probably has a lot of issues the fact that she's been caught for identity theft before and is doing this sort of stuff all really adds up doesn't it i just don't really get it from her perspective maybe trying to validate her own feelings i don't know strange can you imagine how trippy that would be there like as a kid you know that you've not sent a message that your mum is now showing that you've sent on your phone and asking about it and you're like how on earth or who has done that to me you would never at any moment think that your mum has done that that's just crazy so overall i definitely would not blame yourself for not realizing it your mother is just insane my own sister made false accusations against me because i refused to supply alcohol for her party This happened some years ago. I'm in my 30s now, but back then I was 22. My sister was 18 and was my mum's golden child. My dad thankfully has a good head on his shoulders and always called my sister out on her trash. But my mum's interference always meant my sister got off easy anyway. This is what happened back then. My parents decided to take a vacation to ski in Aspen and let my sister watch the house for them. They told her no parties, but that was a rule she straight up ignored. A day after our parents left, my sister started sending out invites to a party and she was promising free hours alcohol i didn't see that post just yet but my sister called me and asked me to go and get her alcohol for her party because i was over 21 and could legally buy it she also wanted me to pay for it and said she'd invite me to the party and introduce me to an easy girl in order to pay me back i told her that i wasn't going to break the law to make her happy she should never have told people her party would have alcohol she screamed at me over the phone that i was ruining her life and that she couldn't take back the invites now that they were all over her facebook i looked at her post and facepalmed i told her that what she did was really stupid and she and her friends were all underage so it's illegal she tried to say it would only be illegal if i knocked on them i said i wouldn't knock but i wasn't going to buy her booze either she screamed at me some more so i hung up the phone well that night my sister had the party and someone called the police for underage drinking after being arrested and confronted by police later on my sister threw me under the bus and said that i'd supplied the alcohol she was using it turns out she actually broke into dad's liquor cabinets and thought it would be better to frame me for her crime The police came and arrested me at my apartment the day after the party They seemed already convinced that I was guilty and didn't really listen to me when I said I was never there But I willingly cooperated with them at the station I told them the whole story and got them to look at my sister's facebook post Thankfully, there were a few people there who listened to me But I still had to sit the night out in a cell while my parents were called My mum and dad flew back home overnight and bailed out both my sister and I But my mum tried to make my dad leave me in jail because my sister had told them her lies as well But my dad took the time to talk to me and look at my sister's facebook Of course he believed me this caused a fight between him and my mum when they got home My dad discovered that my sister had broken into his liquor cabinet and spoke to police on my behalf My mum, however, still wanted the blame to fall on me because as she put it, the charges are ruining my baby's future. My innocence was further proven by the fact that me and my car were seen on CCTV when I left work and when I arrived at home soon after as the apartment I was living in then had CCTV cameras to watch the parking lots. My car didn't move from there for the rest of the day and night. In my sister's story to the police, I'd driven out and gotten the alcohol for her. But I wasn't seen on CCTV in any liquor store in the county, and my bank account showed no transactions buying alcohol. My parents' house also had a camera at the front door, and my car was never seen in the driveway that day. After being confronted with those facts, my sister's story changed to say that I already had the alcohol and gave it to her at my apartment. But my sister's car had never shown up at my apartment either, and there was like three cheap beers in my apartment fridge and no hard alcohol. My sister finally had to give up on her lies and my parents were severely disappointed in her but my mum still tries to convince me to take the fall for my sister she came to my apartment and actually demanded that i tell police that it was all my fault i said i wasn't going to ruin my future for my sister she refused to leave though and went from demanding to begging she even got on her knees and tried to convince me that she and my dad would make everything okay in the long run if i just took the blame now i said i'd rather live my life
my life poor than have that felony on my record. She threw a huge fit and started throwing things because I refused to do as she wanted. Then I threatened to call the police and she left my apartment, cussing me out like a mad woman. I've never heard so many F-bombs out of her before or since, but she kept them up all the way to her car and followed it up with saying that she should have aborted me before driving off. I called my dad right away and told him everything that happened. He was insanely angry and got in a huge fight with my mum as soon as she got home. She didn't even deny anything she said or did because she deemed it would have been for the greater good of their daughter. But my dad told her that she couldn't destroy me to save my sister. Then he threatened to divorce her if she didn't try to make things right. She ended up sobbing and then saying she'd do whatever he wanted. My dad said that it was couples and family counselling or it was divorce. My mum signed a prenup before she married him, so really she had no choice. In the family counselling, I called her out on how she always believed my sister's lies. My sister tried to say they were not lies, but each one I pointed out from over the years said otherwise. I'd taken the time to write a list of all the ones I could remember from the past decade that had all been proven as lies. And my mum and sister were just forced to stay silent as I read them all. They tried to interject repeatedly, but my dad and the counsellor silenced them. My sister, now proven beyond a doubt to be a liar and a manipulator just shut down and refused to say anything more to the counselor and my mum finally apologized to me but it was obviously a forced apology because she looked so uncomfortable doing it i told her that her apology was very fake and after so many years of favoritism the damage was already done my relationship with her never really recovered because she was still convinced i was guilty no matter what was said until my sister admitted the truth and then wanted me to pretend to be the guilty one anyway to protect her favorite child but nothing went her way, so she just went back to crying about it. When my sister went to court, my mum pleaded with the judge to go easy on her for the charges of underage drinking and giving other underage people alcohol, as well as attempting to frame me for her crime. She'd also resisted arrest when the police came and shut down the party. She was very drunk when it happened. They kept her in a cell overnight to sober up, and then she told police I'd been the one to provide the alcohol. My mum's begging, along with the relentless lawyer my parents hired, got the judge to cut a deal, providing my sister plead guilty, which she did not want to do. But her lawyer highly recommended she take said deal to avoid jail time because there was no other way of keeping her from getting a felony on her record. My sister's lawyer used the fact that the alcohol had not been bought that day, but rather had already been in the house long before the party happened to help lessen the charges. My sister's Facebook had also been completely deleted by her as soon as she was able to in order to hide the post. The judge just wanted the case over with, so my sister got off with a huge fine that our mum paid most of out of her own pockets and a couple of years probation. She was also made to get therapy too by our dad. She's never really showed actual remorse for what she did though and only had animosity for me no matter how in the wrong she was. She was eventually diagnosed as a narcissist after dad made her go and see a doctor. After her probation and four years of college was over, she decided she was going to leave home for California and never come back once she landed a good job. She currently works in an office in LA and we've not spoken in years. Dad got her that job, but she's not shown any real appreciation for it. Even my mum has given up on her ever coming home for the holidays and us being a real family again. It tore her up inside for a few years, but now she's just bitter. She doesn't really blame me anymore, but we only seem to show indifference to each other. Just because my sister cut her off wouldn't make me the new de facto favourite. It just means that my mum lost her baby and isn't getting her back. She can't leave my dad because she's too reliant on him, despite having her own career. She'd never want to be on her own again, so she's just become a shell of her former self. Now things between me and my dad are still great. He's pretty much disowned my sister for what she's done and has stopped caring if she'll ever talk to him again. He and my mum don't even sleep in the same bedroom anymore. She moved into the guest room some five years ago and has stayed there. Their marriage is really only one on paper these days. Now, that is the end of the story, but OP has provided us with some information and also a couple of edits to give some more context. So, some info. It's a felony or misdemeanor in OP's country to provide alcohol to minors. And my sister provided stolen alcohol to at least a dozen people who were under 21. Then she resisted arrest and tried to frame me by lying to police. The fact that she got off easy thanks to the shark tooth lawyer my parents hired was incredibly lucky. Not that she was ever appreciative. 
The judge hit her with a fine for each person she gave alcohol to, which added up. And with the cost of the lawyer, well, my parents were out of a lot of money. All right then, and now onto the first edit. Yes, my parents are wealthy, especially my dad as he's a business owner. He owns several businesses actually, one big one and a few smaller ones. He even owns one of the local gas stations. And the town we live in is full of bored police that are just itching to get some action. I also heard that a couple of the miners arrested at that party were the kids of police as well, which didn't help my odds when the cops came for me. The reason the investigation went as far as it did is because my dad pushed it through. I also went out of my way to provide some of the evidence, like the CCTV from my job, my apartment complex, and my bank statements showing I didn't buy the alcohol. The rest, my dad pushed for. He had a lawyer get the CCTV from every liquor store in the county for that day. My mum actually tried to talk him out of doing that. In the end, this all took way too much to prove my sister was a liar, because she tried to stick to her story hard even after my parents discovered she got the alcohol from my dad's liquor cabinets. And yes, my parents lost a ton of money, basically paying off the court to dismiss most of my sister's charges. My sister had to pay like 10%. That's about it. And that's just the little bit my parents made her pay. They still pay for her college after that as well. So people calling this out as rich people drama are exactly right because it is just that. At the time this went on, I was still in college myself, but my dad insisted I have a part-time job to learn the value of work. And he was exactly right about that. My family is wealthy, but my dad tried to keep me from acting spoiled growing up. I even bought my own first car with my money that I earned working part-time. But I can't say the same for my sister, as my mum treated her like a princess. The rest of the family as a whole also hates my sister after what she did back then, so there wasn't much love lost when she ghosted us, save for my mum. She cried about it often for an entire year. And then one final edit. Yes, this happened in the US. And yes, it was stupid the way the police arrested me. My dad had some pretty strong words with them about that, but I guess the cops had nothing better to do and the arrest was expunged from my record after I was proven innocent. But as someone in the comments has pointed out, it is scary how easily your freedom can be taken away. I've instinctively avoided police ever since that happened. For them, arresting the son of a rich guy must have been a big scandal waiting to happen. And no, no one was injured as a result of DUI, but I've spoken with my dad and he said there were a few DUIs because a few of the miners there got in their cars and tried to drive away when the police arrived. Considering I heard a few of the people there were the kids of police officers, that only made things worse for me. The cops that arrested me both looked middle-aged, so if their kids were involved, that may explain why they treated me like I was guilty. And finally, those who say this is fake, I wish it was, because it's so stupid that it really should be, but my ungrateful sister broke our family and nearly destroyed my reputation as well. These days, everyone in the town has forgotten about her. She lost most, if not all of her friends after that party because they were all arrested. Wow, what an incredible story. It sounds to me like your mum and your sister are both narcissists. I can't believe some of their actions in this one. It just got worse and worse as we went on and on. Like your dad is clearly a great bloke. Despite the fact that they're both awful, he still, you know, dips into his own pocket to help them out as any good man should do realistically. But to be honest with you, I think he needs to get a divorce from your mum. Like I know it's kind of a deep thing to say, but she is not a nice person. Another thing as well is it's actually mental to see how little evidence it takes to have your freedom stolen. I know you're giving context as to why you might have been arrested so quickly with so little evidence and you know the police officers may have had children involved but still like do your job properly you can't have bias when you're a police officer can you i mean we've seen how that's gone in the past goodness me the fact that he was just taken away and kept in a cell for that long is pretty crazy when you had nothing to do with what happened i mean i don't really know how it works but surely you could sue the police or something i don't know entirely if it's worth going down that road if you can even be bothered but yeah overall a lot of stuff i very much dislike about the story but a very good one to start off today's episode let's carry on so what if there's a fire ring up my groceries recently i was talking with some co-workers about old jobs we had and i remembered this gem i remember this story vividly because it was so absurd january 1st 2017 i am 23 at the time and i was in the middle of my shift at the local grocery store as a checkout clerk or the official term of front end associates i was just chatting with customers as i rang up their chips and sodas and rotisserie chickens like a usual day when one of the stockers ran up behind me and yelled how busy is everyone confused i simply gestured to my line of people but he had our attention since he never did anything like that my manager asked why do you ask everything okay once you're all finished with your current customers everyone needs to leave there's a fire in the back immediately all who were not being checked out abandoned their carts and left the building 
except for Gerald's. Gerald was the next person in my line, and he was going to be served. The customer before him paid, since that was where I was with his transaction when the stalker told us about the fire, and I grabbed my jacket from under the counter so I could evacuate with everyone else. Gerald, however, was not having it. You will not leave until you've rung up my groceries. Now, Gerald was very old. Mid-70s, early 80s, somewhere around there. He was very tall and lanky, wearing a tan V-neck sweater. I don't know why I remember that, but I do. He wore black, thick rim glasses and would have generally been very non-threatening to anyone else. Sir, there's a fire. We have to get out of here for both of our safeties. The door's over there. Let's hurry. However, it seemed that today was not Gerald's day and I was in the wrong person's way at the wrong time. I don't care. I need these items. Ring them up now. He really was threatening me to ring up his seven items while smoke was filling the aisles. Since it was seven items, no manager was in sight, and I wasn't really feeling like getting a black eye in addition to having my workplace burn, I quickly rung him up. All the while, he's thanking me, quite condescendingly. I was paying him no mind since I knew the tone. Finally, my manager showed back up to make sure everyone had left. I ran over to her. Please help me. This guy won't let me leave. What do you wait, what do you mean won't let you leave? Did you tell him about the fire? Yeah, but he said he doesn't care. Oh my god, absolutely not. Look, you go outside with everyone else and wait for the firefighters. I'll take care of this. I went to grab my things again, and while I was leaving, I could hear them both yelling. Where is she going? She has to finish. My manager interrupts. Sir, there's a fire a fire you have to leave no i still have to pay you've got to be kidding me i'm the manager you can have it it's free just get out of here this is terrible customer service i'm never coming back i met up with the rest of the staff in the parking lot and they asked what took me so long so of course i told them my manager came out and confirmed the story we never did see gerald again About the fire, it was actually pretty contained on its own. It was in a closed off area opposite the bathrooms and was surrounded by tile walls that blocked the food from the sparks. We were able to get back to work after it was put out, starting with putting back all the abandoned carts full of food. As for what caused it, it seems the chickens used to make the rotisserie chickens weren't stored properly, so they started to thaw prematurely. The water and chicken juice leaked through the tile floor and sparked an electrical fire. The best part was that when we learned this, we were still in the parking lot, I looked over to the parking lot, to the side of the building, and saw at least 50 turkey buzzards in the trees. I shook a co-worker while laughing hysterically. They can smell them. Everyone else joined in on the hysterical laughing. It was truly the weirdest way to start the year. You know what? While Gerald is clearly entitled, and I'm not entirely sure what he was doing here, I have a lot of respect for him because clearly he's at an age and a stage of his life now where he doesn't really care. You know, he's past the point of giving a dang about anything and I'm here for it. Like, I respect someone like that. Yeah, it's a bit weird um, not getting out of a building when you know it's on fire, but to him, not getting the groceries that he needs is less important than a fire in the back of a shop. Priorities, I, I kind of back it. What I don't really get though, I mean, I- I'll be honest i don't really get anything that happened in the story but what i what i don't really understand at all is when he says terrible customer service after being told by the manager that you can just take all the items for free that sounds like excellent customer service to me um so apart from that i back gerald what a man entitled squatter tried to steal my brother's house Several years ago, my brother, Dan, moved from California to Washington State and built a three-bedroom house on one of two parcels of land he'd bought when he was just 18 years old. He lived in a nice community with a small lake and had an HOA. During the 2008 economic crash, he ran into financial trouble, so we helped him. To repay us for the help, in March of 2016, he came down to California for an extended period to work on our house, which was neglected because of helping him. He was very proficient at renovating houses and did fantastic work. In November, my brother his friend jake called him and asked if a friend of his tuna could stay in one of the rooms for 400 per month dan had worked for many years with jake doing construction for a house flipper so he trusted jake's judgment he needed the money and thought it might be good to have someone trustworthy there to watch his house dan drove back up to washington cleaned out a room put a lock on his bedroom door locked the door and put some of his things in a storage area up out of the way in the garage tuna seemed nice and gave dan 400 for the first month There was never a written rental agreement. It was just verbal and meant to be temporary because Dan was going to return in six months. Tuna never sent another payment. We would call and ask her and she always said it had been sent, but nothing ever arrived. So what was going on at his house? We pieced together that something wrong was going on there after Dan's neighbor called. And after questioning Jake, the neighbor complained that the house had turned into a drug house full of people and cars coming and going all hours of the night. At the beginning of June 2017, Dan drove back to Washington and handed Tuna a three-day eviction notice. She left, stating that she had somewhere else to live 
and would get her stuff later He allowed her to retrieve her stuff at a later date. He just wanted her out He started working on repairs and cleaning up the house I mailed Dan a care package with some clothes a california themed shopping bag and gift cards for gas and food Five days later tuna showed up with two men who punched dan in the face They wanted to take the house back by force dan went to the neighbor and called the police The police came and instead of arresting the men and tuna They took dan to jail for missing a child support court date Which then put a warrant on him before coming to california He thought everything regarding child support back payments for his independent successful 23 year old adult child had been taken care of He had no idea about a court date since they notified by mail and tuna had never forwarded his mail Which was one of the things she promised to do the child support scam on Dan is another issue I'll have to submit later. So the police essentially handed the house over to Tuna. She and her cronies went in, changed the locks, and placed a long metal bar across the inside of the garage door so it couldn't be opened from the outside. They stole the package I sent to Dan and spent the gift cards. Meanwhile, my family and I were on vacation in Hawaii and I received a phone call from Dan in jail. I spent a whole day of my vacation in the hotel room trying to figure out how to get him out. Bail bonds could not be used for child support cases. Finally, they let him out when I paid a child support payment of $350. He'd been in jail for three days and the squatters had dug themselves in. So when he returned to his house, he had to call the police to arrest them for trespassing. After all, Tuna had been evicted, left, and no longer had permission to be there. They were squatters by all accounts, but the state defers to people who just claim they are renting, therefore requiring a landlord to go through the court system to remove the so-called tenants who are actually squatters. The police came and screwed him over once again. Tuna claimed she was renting the entire house and the police believed her instead of Dan. She told the policeman that she would leave in 10 days and the policeman told Dan that he could have his house back in 10 days because Tuna said she would leave by then. Are you kidding me? Dan was instructed to then leave the premises or be arrested. It was his house. She was trespassing. He got into his minivan and drove away with nowhere to stay but in the van. Of course, Tuna did not leave after 10 days. Dan went back after 10 days and called the police again. Once again, the police told him to leave or be arrested. We didn't know what to do next. One of the HOA board members, who had some experience in managing real estate properties, attempted to help us. She said that he needed a 20-day eviction notice, then Tuna would be out, and this had always worked for her when she had to evict tenants. Okay, so the 20-day notice was posted and we waited. Tuna did not leave. Dan went over to his house and started cleaning up trash strewn all over the yard waiting for her to leave but tuna called the police stating that she was a renter and he was disturbing her once again dan was asked to leave or be arrested this time dan put his phone on speaker and i heard the whole interaction between him and the police yep he had to leave or be arrested dan couldn't even get his construction tools out of the garage and couldn't work without his tools and with being homeless how do you even work What was going to happen to all of his possessions, his sentimental things? His room had been broken into long before. His things removed and people had used the room. It was near the end of summer. We were paying his mortgage payments and it was getting so hard on everyone. Then something nice happened. A kind friend, Adam, asked him to stay at his house, which Dan did. During this time, Dan worked for Adam with loan tools and also went to some landlord slash tenant educational meetings. The people at the meetings were helpful and instructed Dan on how to proceed by taking the matter to court. The police would not go further without a court order to physically evict Tuna. It would be difficult to afford the cost to hire a lawyer, but eventually we did and we ended up getting one. Dan posted a court appearance on the door of his house since Tuna never answered the door and that is what you do legally in this case. Every time he posted a court appearance, he had to legally give her one week notice, which he did. He showed up at courts and Tuna failed to show up. So he won by default, right? Well, wrong. The judge said that Tuna was not given proper notice because the notice was posted by Dan instead of an anonymous person. Dan walked out of the courtroom. The lawyers from the landlord and tenant meetings were there and couldn't believe it. Unfortunately, Adam had to move out of his house he was renting. So Dan had to go back to living in his van. It was autumn in the Pacific Northwest and getting cold. The police had started harassing him if he slept in his van. We rented motel rooms for Dan. Once while at a motel, Dan heard a knock on the door in the middle of the night. He thought it was the staff and opened the door. Instead, two men burst into the room and proceeded to beat the heck out of him to rob him. They broke his finger and gave him a concussion. Dan ran to his van, drove it to a parking lot and slept. He refused to go back to the motel. Things were starting to go downhill in a very bad way. I found a lawyer from a non-profit who worked for free to help. 
He actually used that three-day eviction notice that Dan had given Tuna back in June as a basis for the case. I'd found it online, the wording was appropriate, and it had been served properly. The lawyer had to jump through endless hoops and court appearances. The same judge presided over every case that had to do with evictions, and she always favored the tenants, including entitled ones. This took forever, like three more months, and Dan became haggard, homeless, sick, depressed, and at times went missing. Once I called every hospital, jail, homeless shelter, and even the food bank looking for him. His van was impounded four times, he was hospitalized four times, he was endlessly hunted down and harassed by the police. Three times I found him because I was listed as his emergency contact on his state insurance when he showed up at hospitals. While all of this was happening to Dan, my husband was in a serious motorcycle accident and I had to take care of him, change his dressing, etc. Okay, I'm crying right now. This was so hard to endure, remember, and difficult to write about. I couldn't leave and fly up to Washington to help my brother, but I was doing everything down here to get his house back with the lawyer. I got him motel rooms at other motels when I could. I paid four times to get his van out of impound. I sent him cell phones and care packages delivered at UPS stores. Before we even continue, can I just say, OP, you're an absolute hero. Wow. One time, Dan was lost and didn't have his van or phone. He ended up at a hospital who contacted me. He told me that he'd felt really sick and had gone to the hospital earlier, who released him after examining him, even after he pleaded with them to let him stay because he felt horribly sick. He ended up collapsed on the sidewalk by the Salvation Army shelter, who wouldn't let him in, and another homeless person called 911. So he was back at that hospital with a very serious condition affecting his heart. I told the hospital to please call me at release time so I could arrange a motel for Dan. They didn't. He was then found in a park in frigid weather, dressed in a pair of scrubs, a t-shirt, a hoodie, and one shoe. A city policeman called me and took him to a motel where he stayed a while. I sent a care package there. Dan told me that one time when he was being harassed by the police for cooking food in a park, he mouthed off and told them they were communists and it was their fault that he was homeless because they gave his house to a squatter. A fire truck arrived so he wasn't arrested with the firemen there, but I don't think the police liked him much for saying that. In October, Dan was arrested for drunk driving while he was sleeping in a Walmart parking lot. Like how? I had to bail him out of jail over that. Every time he didn't get to court hearings, they would post warrants for his arrest. One time he was in jail and they refused to give him his medication, so I had to bail him out because he felt so awful. In mid-November, the police arrested Dan again for not showing up to court for that so-called drunk driving incident. He begged me to bail him out. Even though the bail bondsman paid the bail in the late afternoon, the jail released him in the middle of the night, again with no vehicle, impounded, a dead cell phone, no charger, it was in the van, no money, etc. I found out later that this jail only releases people at night so they can get credit and are paid by the state for the whole day. That night he was released, it was our deceased mother's birthday. Dan was then found unconscious in a ditch by a seawall in a Starbucks parking lot. He had a broken femur, a broken hip, a cracked spine, a head contusion, and that finger was still broken from the motel incident. The doctors evaluated that he'd been hit in the back of his head with a blunt object. We do not know who did it. The last thing he remembers was a police car driving by. He was airlifted to a major hospital in Seattle, about 50 miles from where he was. I took a flight up to Seattle as soon as I could and visited him. The doctors showed me the x-rays and he had countless rods and pins put into his body to put him back together. By this time, we were getting closer to having his house back. I went by the house with Adam's brother-in-law, Paul, who was packing heat. We pounded on the door and I demanded that the squatters hand over my dead mother's rocking chair. The stupid friend, Jake, was there and he handed it through the door. It's a big heirloom mission star chair and they'd burned into the chair in four inch letters the word wasted. The court order finally became available, but then we had to schedule the eviction according to when the police had time to do it, which was another two weeks. It was scheduled for the beginning of December. I went back home to California briefly and returned the night of the eviction. Dan was in the hospital for almost two weeks. When he was released, I arranged a nice long-term stay type hotel back near home for him to live at until the police evicted the squatters. Paul helped us a lot. He was with the police at the eviction, changed all the locks and secured the house. He picked up Dan at the hotel and Dan got to witness the eviction of that entitled female dog from hell she was the only one left in the house a notice had been posted on the door to warn everyone to leave but as usual she didn't think there'd be any reason she would have to it took her completely by surprise the police pounded on the door and demanded she leave immediately she asked if she could get this and that but no she couldn't she grabbed her little dog purse and left with nothing else 
The police put a notice on the door after Paul secured everything. Dan was driven back to the hotel and then I arrived. I wish I could have seen the eviction, but I couldn't get a flight early enough. The neighbors said that a bunch of people came to the house that night, pounding on the door trying to get in, but couldn't. They almost called the police, but the people left. We went over there every day for about a week to clean up. Dan was confined to a wheelchair and was on heavy meds, so it was hard. He couldn't help too much, but he did his best. The house was a disaster. There were literally five tons of garbage in the yards around the house. The trash disposal service was not activated during this time, so they just piled it up around the house. On one side was a huge pillar of trash made out of wire fencing. It was about eight feet by eight feet and at least 12 feet high. The front yard was awful with several piles of trash about four feet high. Tuna left every single thing in the kitchen, in the cupboards and rotting food in pans. The carpets were soaked in dog pee. There were clothes and junk everywhere. There was loads of crushed glass embedded into the gravel driveway like she wanted us to get flat tires. Over the doorway from the house into the garage was a dangerous booby trap, which literally could have killed someone. It was made out of large heavy metal clamps with a glass jewelry case teetering on top of the clamps. It could have fallen on top of someone's head if not discovered and someone jarred it a little. The water had been shut off for months by the HOA because they controlled the well and owned the water system. As soon as you don't pay the HOA fees, water is shut off. So all the toilets were clogged up with poop. The sewage system was impossible to unclog and later Dan discovered that they'd thrown dirt and plastic containers down the pipes. He had to go under the house and disassemble the pipes to get everything out. Hanging up on the wall in plain sight in the master bedroom was the California shopping bag I'd mailed to Dan in the package that Tuna had stolen. She hung it there to taunt me. Now I'm not super religious, but I felt the worst kind of evil there and I had to pray and debunk the evil spirits from that house. I stayed for weeks there, cleaning up and I hired some people to do yard clean out to get the front yard clean. Later, Dan and Adam dealt with a pillar of trash at the side of the house. Every construction tool that belonged to Dan was stolen. He couldn't work much from a wheelchair, but needed the tools to repair his own house. Dan persisted though. He finally got to the point where he could walk. Now he can't walk for long periods. He gets tired easily, but he can do things slowly. He has some nice roommates that drive him places and take care of him at times. Many of his tools have been replaced. He sanded off the wasted message on mum's rocking chair. So we've sunk a lot of money into helping him, but what else is one supposed to do? It was a life or death situation. That was his house that he'd built so many years ago. This was the most wicked thing I've ever encountered. It was coming from all directions. We heard that the creepy squatter died a year later. Nobody wanted to take her in and she went from person to person staying wherever. If she would have been decent and kind, she probably could have been a roommate and had a place, but she thought she could just take someone's house. And there we go. That is the end of that incredible story. I don't even know where to begin. The first thing that springs to my mind, as I did mention during that story, is OP, you're an absolute legend. You don't even need to vindicate your actions throughout this entire thing. The amount of money and time that you spend on your brother is incredible. And yes, you could argue that, you know, your family is your right to do that. You have to do something like that. You've got to look after your own. But to that extent, I'm sorry. That is just incredible. Like, again, all I can say is just astonishing. Incredible scenes. As for Dan, I don't even know what to say. Um, it's just Where do you even begin with a story like that? So deeply sad. But his bravery and his persistence throughout all of that is astonishing nonetheless and now you know yeah he's not back to where he was but he's getting there he's got his house finally which is still a mental sentence to say yeah he owns his own house what doesn't make any sense but wow at least he's on the road to recovery and um yeah there's no doubt that he would not be there without your support and finally i do just want to say i still don't really get how it can be possible that a squatter can just do this and then all these rights are in place like squatters rights and all this other stuff that just means that someone can't just say no get out i'm calling the police in my house go i get like the technicality of it yes they were renting etc etc so legally they're allowed to be there but they're also not paying like why are the police not on the owner's side it makes no sense to me we saw it the other day with another one of my episodes entitled parents if you haven't seen that one i'll link it in the end screen that's on screen right now where another squatter just ruined someone else's life and eventually yeah they got destroyed but it took a long time um I don't get it personally. That is our slash of title people. And I enjoyed it very much. And there we go, guys. That is going to do it for three hours of the very best r slash and title people post of this year so far. Really hope you've enjoyed it. If you did and you want to see more from me right away, subscribe to the channel. I post it daily and I'm also posting loads of shorts now as well. And click on the video on screen and link to the top line of the description because that video is simply sensational. Also, if you didn't know, I'm also now on podcast platform. So pretty much what I'm saying is there's no excuse not to listen or watch my beautiful face. Uh, thanks for watching once again, and I'll see you all tomorrow.